Riddle me this, pod fans. What's 90 minutes long arrives every Friday and is all about the Cape Crusader? Why it's blabbing about Batman, the animated series, the newest Patreon-exclusive podcast miniseries on the Talking Simpsons Network. That's right. For the rest of 2021, we'll be covering our 10 favorite episodes of Batman, the animated series, with the same heavy-duty research, clips, and trivia you've come to expect from us. And if you sign up at the $5 level today at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons, you'll get to hear each episode as soon as it goes live. Remember, sign up at patreon.com slash talking simpsons to hear all 10 episodes of blabbing about batman the animated series as well as the 100 plus other exclusive podcast episodes we produce so far so become a patron and join us through the rest of 2021 for another great mini series same bat day same bat podcast feed i heartily endorse this event or product <laughs> Ahoy hoy everybody and welcome to Talking Simpsons, the podcast that's more disturbing than the Museum of Barnyard Oddities. I'm your host, the frequent Grandma's World shopper, Bob Mackey, and this is our chronological exploration of The Simpsons, who is here with me today in the same room. Hey, it's Andrew Gilbert, and this podcast really only has evil purposes. It's true, and who do we have on the line? I'm Libby Watson. Hello. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. And today's episode is Old Money. Hello, young lady. Is your grandmother home? (laughs) Oh, Abe. I can tell I better keep my good eye on you. Damn straight. <laughs> this week's episode aired on March 28th, 1991. And as always, Henry will tell us what happened on this mythical day in real world history. <gasps> oh my God. Oh boy, Bobby. Dances with Wolves beats Goodfellas at the Oscars. New Kids on the Block star <laughs> Donnie Wahlberg is arrested for allegedly setting a hotel room on fire. And the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, Secret of the Ooze, tops the box office with a ninja, ninja rap. That's right. Cemented in all of our heads. Yeah. The height of vanilla ice. Or yeah. perhaps the nadir, depending on uh, uh, your stance. It's, it's such funny timing that they cast him in that movie when he was so hot and cool. And then... Cool like, as ice, perhaps. Cool as ice. And then... But then probably... You know, six, seven months later, when the film finally comes out after they film it, he is as lame as lame can be, and everybody's like, "Oh man, mm-hmm. this this makes the turtles less cool by uh, association of having vanilla ice in your movie." And that was the year we truly learned the Oscars hate dudes rock movies because <laughs> Goodfellas is all about dudes and how they rock yeah. and how those are all cool guys. We need to be like them. We need to emulate them and act like them in every way. Yeah, they are. They're always smart. It's about learning how to be a man too. Like it, obviously, the film Goodfellas is about the strong rules that make you a man mm-hmm. and how every uh, guy's got to trust each other. It's certainly not about toxic masculinity <laughs> in any way. It's yeah. about looking for coats in the back yeah. and how to find them. <laughs> uh, I, certainly when I watch a movie, I know that it's supposed to be a 100% accurate instruction manual for my life. So, uh. mm-hmm. and, and meanwhile, Dances with Wolves completely forgotten. Like, nobody talks about it. It's not it, you know, we got years and years of jokes of, oh, he's Dances with Wolves. I'm... Uh, uh, walks over to bathroom or whatever. I, I I'm just uh, all those like Native American name jokes that we had to have thanks to the popularity of that film. But it's it really is like nothing now. Mm-hmm. And then Goodfellas, I I feel is still pretty pretty big, pretty well well known. We'll and, see and an episode uh, based on it pretty soon in the oh, Simpsons. Oh yes, yeah. That's uh, that was the first production season three episode I believe uh, was B- Bart the Murderer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, New Kids on the Block uh, with. Donnie, Donnie Wahlberg's thing it was that was also talk about like downfall of things like once you know that gave him he was the bad boy of the new kids I was but, gonna ask if he was the bad boy but this was too bad of a boy move <laughs> I think on his part uh, and so uh, it also uh, that got dropped down to a misdemeanor later so he he did not serve any jail time he can still it. vote Donnie Wahlberg yeah, I, I think so <laughs> thank yeah. god yeah and still help run a burger restaurant as far as I know I think he's oh, yeah. involved in Wahlburgers isn't he so uh, oh, yeah. you know that's the real that's a real heartwarming uh, success story there. Ninja Turtles 2, Secret of the Ooze. I uh, loved that movie mm. as a little kid. It was one of my... But I 
did even as a kid i think i noticed that the turtles were way less violent in it and weren't like kicking people in the face as much it wasn't know? as dark yeah as the first movie it was dark and gritty once i saw at the start of the movie when leonardo stabbed his swords into the ceiling to like swing and kick a guy instead of at least in the first movie not that he like chops people's heads off but he at least swings his swords mm-hmm. in an attempt to hit someone once i saw that in secret of the use i knew things were getting a little too light after I guess for me, uh, my opinion on this movie, I did see it in theaters too, Henry, and I thought this is more like the cartoon and I like it more, Mm -hmm. but now I don't care about any of the movies, (laughs) so... My, my tastes have changed. I managed to entirely miss the Turtles as a kid. I mm. never never saw a Turtles movie or any other uh, Turtle content, so I, I feel like I really missed out there. Well, Libby, in your neck of the woods, I believe they were called Hero Turtles and not Ninja Turtles for, for really? a time. Oh, God, that's really lame. <laughs> because of the uh, the nunchuck ban. Yes, yeah. N- <laughs> the nunchucks were banned in, in parts of, uh, of of the UK because... Is that uh, true? I, but yeah, it was. Uh, you can find look up Ninja Hero Hero, Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. You'll see the logo of, like for the uh, British sold goods of the toys. Yeah, at least huh. until the uh, late 90s, they were censoring nunchucks out of video games sold in the UK. Mm. Oh my so. god, wow. I had a, Apparently I had a nunchuckless childhood. I had no idea. I'm <laughs> the, pretty sure I remember the, the Simpsons episode um, where Bart, uh, doesn't Bart get some nunchucks at some point or want nunchucks? He asks for them in this very episode. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, he does. Grandpa <laughs> doesn't know what they are. <laughs> Oh, of course. Wow. Okay. Now this is really, this is uh, really embarrassing for me in my failing old person memory. Although not old enough to have seen this when it premiered. I was one when this, uh, mm. when this premiered. So this, this was not among the first Simpsons episodes that I saw. <laughs> well, why? let's have a formal introduction yes. though to our guest here. So joining us today is Libby Watson. Uh, she is the writer of the healthcare newsletter, Sick Note, also a frequent podcast guest. If you like podcasts, you probably have heard Libby on something. <laughs> I guess that's true. Yeah. The last couple of weeks I've had to promote several appearances in a row and uh, it's it's kind of embarrassing because I don't have a podcast of my own I'm just like the person who shows up on podcasts <laughs> so um, that's uh, that's my moniker I guess person who shows up on podcasts yeah I was asking Henry before the show started I said to him I did research on Libby does she not have a podcast because I only associate her with being on podcasts as part of my <laughs> podcast lifestyle that I live but no you are just uh, in the orbit of many podcasts right yeah I'm gonna have to start introducing myself as a uh, guy who goes on podcasts i guess so, you know i'll just i'll just trash the whole sick note thing and be like hey yeah maybe i go on podcasts <laughs> uh yeah i was like oh something does she not have a microphone of her own because how do you not have a podcast in, in this day and age <laughs> but i mean yeah yeah you're a great guest on many many a podcast where we're honored to have you here we we wanted to invite you too because previous yeah that episode will go up before this one uh we had on uh brendan james of the the blowback podcast and he mentioned that like he didn't start watching Simpsons until you told him uh, it finally sold him on watching it in like adult years. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Brendan and I have been friends for many years. One of the uh, few good things to come out of having a, a Twitter account is my friendship <laughs> with Brendan. And yeah, I remember him telling me that he was one of the kids whose parents didn't let him watch The Simpsons, which is not something I, I don't think I really encountered that in the UK. I think I don't think British parents quite got the same anti-Bart hysteria that seems to have affected many American parents in the 90s, because I don't think I knew any kids who weren't allowed to watch The Simpsons, which mm. is so, I mean, I had pretty permissive parents anyway. Anyway, I uh, I was watching like you know Terminator Two and stuff when mm-hmm. I was <laughs> when I was seven uh, or whatever because my mum was cool. But um, mm. yeah, uh, I was I was not exposed to that that idea. And now I've asked around my friends, and lots of people have said they you know even my husband you know he said that he wasn't allowed to watch The Simpsons when he was a kid, and that blew my mind. You know, on our show we've we've heard from two types of people growing up that their parents were either lax and let them watch it regularly, which was Bob and my experience, or uh, we have folks whose parents parents wouldn't let them watch it so they'd either go to a friend's house to watch it or once it started airing in syndication before five mm-hmm. o'clock when parents came home or before like six o'clock that's when everybody started watching it like that's if you started watching in the 90s that if you're even younger than us then you uh just downloaded it on kazan your mm. parents can't tell you what what not to watch <laughs> well absolutely and quite right too um yeah I, I mean for us i really have very strong memories of it being on bbc2 at six o'clock every day uh and i 
I'm, I'm pretty sure that I had friends whose families would like sit down to eat dinner and watch The Simpsons together, like as a family. So yeah, kind of a far cry from the uh, restrictive households that many of my friends grew up in. Well, I have many questions about being a, a British Simpsons viewer. We've we've talked to se- several folks who grew up on that side of the Atlantic. So I was like, so yeah, you watched it on BBC Two, mainly not Sky One. I guess the Dish service that a lot of people, uh, many British people watch Simpsons on. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't, uh, I didn't get Sky until I was about ten. I remember actually, I have a very strong memory of coming home and getting off the school bus and my mom pointing out to me, "Look, we've got a, we've got a Sky Dish now." So that was huge. But that was because I was excited to watch the Pokemon cartoon, <laughs> uh, which was a pretty, pretty short-lived interest for me. I think uh, kind of grew out of that uh, pretty fast. But yeah, it was that. That was a pretty big moment. But I, I do sort of remember that the watching it on sky you know when i was a teenager sky guy one tended to show the like the later episodes you know they would get the kind of new simpsons episodes so you know that was through i was probably watching those through about 2005 or so hmm. um but it was also on bbc2 and channel 4 uh so you, you had lots of opportunities to watch the simpsons <laughs> um on tv as a kid but i i did also have some vhs tapes that were like you know some sort of simpsons collections on vhs that i had and then i had I think i had a couple that we recorded off the tv as well hmm. do you remember when you started watching the show like what the first episode could have been yes i do very clearly um i remember it was the it was the first time i went to my dad's house after my parents got divorced um (laughs) and uh (laughs) sad little story and um i remember it was um the monorail episode Mm. uh, was being shown for the first time on on british television um which is kind of remarkable as an entry point i think that's still my favorite episode Uh, and i remember being pretty i mean i would have been four i think maybe five but i'm pretty sure i was four Hmm. and i remember being pretty blown away by how funny it was so if you're hovering around 40 like henry and i uh our stories are very boring what was your first episode of the simpsons it was the first one that aired the end the first time because it was the new one yes Yes. Uh, yeah, I saw that sort of uh, prompt Twitter thing that was going around a while ago that was like, uh, you know, your real horoscope or whatever is the first Simpsons episode that aired in your lifetime. And I, th- I think mine would have been the first episode of season two. Hmm. Uh, I can't quite remember. I yeah. couldn't do that, but I was able to do which Garfield uh, premiered yes. on your birthday. Some people I know were too old for that, and I felt <laughs> superior yeah. to them just in that moment. Yeah, there's always something. There's always someone older than you, I guess. I, I was curious, too, with, uh, you know, watching it on, on Sky One, I I saw that uh, it, it Sky One is like shutting down or it's it's changing names or something. So I was I didn't know this about the Sky One viewership of Simpsons, but that like Domino's sponsored it for like a long time and people associate Simpsons with Domino's over there. Yeah, I guess you're right. You know, I, I, if you'd asked me who sponsored The Simpsons on Sky One, I would have had no idea. But now you say that, I have, I'm absolutely sure that that was the case. And I do remember seeing Domino's ads. I used to watch um, Futurama and Malcolm in the Middle on Sky One as well. There was that was really the only reason to watch Sky hmm. One. I don't. It was other than that, it was just like total trash. The only other show I remember them having was Fear Factor, <laughs> um, which is kind of kind of strange. I don't really remember if they even had any like original Sky One shows. But yeah, I definitely definitely remember seeing the the Domino's logo we didn't even I don't think we had Domino's in my town or if we did they didn't deliver to where I lived so it was always a a far off dream for me (laughs) well I guess too you know you would later in life move to the United States like what did did watching Simpsons like shape your assumptions or view on America before you came over here totally yeah I have a I have an Irish friend in the US as well and we always we're always quoting the Simpsons back and forth and uh, I do think it's (laughs) It's it's hard to say that like I thought America was good because of the Simpsons because I don't <laughs> think that the Simpsons really portrays America in that positive a light. It's re- you know it's pretty satirical and it makes fun of it a lot. But I you know I do think in my head it it was you know for many years and most of my childhood you know until I beca- I was what twelve or something really started to become like aware of politics. America was where the Simpsons took place and that was pretty much it. You know I mean when I got a little older I started watching Friends and like other American shows and stuff. But for the longest time it was just simpsons land so i mean it's i think we can partially blame the simpsons for me immigrating to this ridiculous country <laughs> well it's pretty accurate at yeah. least in this time period mm-hmm. of the american mm-hmm. experience it captures the 90s pretty well mm-hmm. like yeah. uh, you know they started drinking clear soda when we were drinking clear soda <laughs> all, all the things <laughs> and well also, uh, so in the uk too doesn't simpsons only have one commercial break there's not a commercial break every every act it's like right in the middle yeah so it, it depends so on bbc too bbc channel 
channels don't have any commercial breaks at all. Mm. So you would just watch the whole thing at, at once. Channel 4, they would you do tend to have just one commercial break in the middle. I don't know if this has changed now because I've been in the US for like 10 years. Um, and when I go home, I don't tend to watch much television um, So because uh, it sucks. Um, but yeah, it was, it was strange when I came to the US and I was like, wait, the show just started. Why is there a commercial break? Or like, you know, it was it was very, very strange to me because growing up it was always you know 15 minutes of show and then a commercial break and then another 10 minutes and then a commercial break and then the next show starts you know that seemed more logical to me at least it's also logical to put day before month in calendars but we don't do that here mm, either it still like, feels wrong to me yeah <laughs> yeah i assume it's because it's easier to get people to sit down and, and not go and make a cup of tea or whatever if the commercials are like sprinkled throughout it's harder for the people to just walk away whereas the way we do it it's like a very clear like all right now you can go and get a snack break mm. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, uh, me, me and Bob were uh, we did see this live when it was new. Mm-hmm. Uh, though actually, I guess now is the time for Henry's tale of the tape when oh, I boy. talk about how I recorded this or not. I, we were running out of them in the later seasons. <laughs> now we're back to them. We're back to them. Yeah. Well, so um, this episode shamefully was the first one we missed as a mm. family recording The Simpsons. Like so, a dark day. Is it because you were seeing a grandmother or grandfather? Perhaps? Uh, you know, I think it was a school event. Mm. It's it's cloudy in my mind where we were, but I do recall being in a car ride, coming back from where we were and saying, like, we're missing The Simpsons. It's on <laughs> right now. We're not recording it. Like, I was very upset. And we got home, like, late. We were there, like... 10 minutes into the episode we missed the first act and we started recording it but then it was just this incomplete episode and it made it it was driving me crazy for the longest time a few years later it would then air in syndication and i would make sure to tape it off of syndication so we finally like had it complete but then i knew it was edited for syndication and we were missing two episodes so i didn't feel complete with this episode until i got the dvd Hmm. of it like that was when i finally Finally felt complete with the Simpsons, and you saw more of Grandpa and B's not really funny courtship, and that uh, really made your life complete. Yeah, the I mean, the biggest cuts were in the syndicated version were just to the like conversation, the the riding in a car conversation mm. one. So yeah, I mean, now that I think about this, I'm like, eh, I'm glad if I could pick one season two episode to miss, probably the very special episode with Grandpa's girlfriend is was a fine one to miss. Yeah, I remember when I first learned about that that syndicated indication difference thing i don't know if that happened in the uk because i only had a few on vhs and then i had a a season six dvd when i was older but didn't tend to have i didn't have the whole box set or anything and then when i was at university uh there was like this internal file sharing network uh kind of underground file sharing network that was Mm. extremely fast and so instantly downloaded all the, the classic seasons of the simpsons and those were tv rips um and uh I noticed that there were jokes missing and I was like what what the hell why <laughs> where's the joke about you know barking up the wrong tree or whatever because you know in, in my brain it was like it's, it's very uh, disconcerting you know when something is missing from oh, something yeah. you've seen so many times um, yeah. and so then you know I didn't really understand that until I learned about this thing where they get cut down for syndication and it, again I'm not sure that that doesn't happen in the UK but I don't think it does and I think that might be because the ads are the ad breaks are shorter yeah our podcast is very very thorough as you'll learn uh, as a guest very soon but we never go over the syndication cuts just because those episodes now uh to see them with these cuts you kind of have to go out of your way don't you you either yeah. have to download the wrong uh you know files or whatever or watch them on broadcast tv perhaps i would guess i would i would suppose that you know i i haven't turned on local broadcast tv in a very long time especially yeah. not in the afternoon when simpsons would air but if it were to be on i wouldn't i definitely wouldn't think they'd have more time uh or they'd have less time for commercials now for syndicated ones i think they'd probably even hack away more jokes in it i guess if you really want us to talk about these things i say to you disney plus is like seven bucks right yeah and you pay pay (laughs) once watch them all and then uh cancel or whatever one and the dvds have been out for so long with the you know non-syndicated cuts it's like syndicated cuts now it, it feels like work those are the rarer thing these days 
yeah. Yeah, I, I guess the only way that you can do it is to go to Warwick University and download the <laughs> uh, the terrible quality files that I downloaded back in 2010 or whatever. I mean, they were t- they were trash, and they had little they had a little like um, TV channel bug in the corner and everything. And I was just like, you know, yeah. just like huffing from a <laughs> paper bag or whatever to get my Simpsons fix. You know, I still see animated gifs uh, of the Simpsons made with those old files that have the little bug mm-hmm. in the corner. And whenever I see a non Frankie non Frankieac animated Simpsons gif I get upset because Frankieac <laughs> is there it's so easy to use yeah. I don't need these crusty 2002 era Simpsons gifs in my life get them out oh, of yeah, there no excuse at this point I mean I remember making my own screenshots for, for meme usage from, from those terrible files you know before we had Frankieac and then Frankie I mean I, I seriously think that I mean my opinion is the Library of Congress should buy the classic Simpsons episodes anyway so that they can be free to all and not be owned by the Disney Corporation but mm-hmm. if, you know if we can't have that then I do think the Library of Congress should buy uh, Frankieac. You know, I'd love for my tax dollars to go towards that. I, I'll. It's been nice that Disney hasn't shut it down <laughs> yet, and I hope they never do. I hope they can at least recognize that it's a free advertising for their like stuff at the very least. Yeah, yeah it's I mean, not- it's, it's got to be that they just haven't found out about it yet. So no one tell mm. Disney. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's also funny to think of a time of like before it became so easy to like memeify the Simpsons with you know they actually had to do your own work of like well VLC up here and then screenshot like it. yeah I remember making memes in the past pre Frankieac which is like pre 2016 I would go to my shelf f- look at the booklet that came with the DVD say which episode is on which disc put that disc in load up all the menus load up the episode then do a screenshot in VLC and then export that into Photoshop mm-hmm. so many steps <laughs> it took yeah. so long uh, before 2016 Frankieac is a blessing I know we, we really sound like old people now you know in my day I had to walk seven miles to school or you know I had to make my own memes on without Frankieac. <laughs> <laughs> The Simpsons will be right back. Will Grandpa Simpson blow the family fortune? Change, please. No! The Simpsons. Friday night at 11.30 on Fox 54. Welcome to the break, everybody. Hope you're enjoying this as much as a trip to Grandma's World. And a big thank you to our guest this week, Libby Watson. It was so fun having Libby on. Everybody should check out her very informative Substack Sick Note. You want to learn a lot about the horrors of the American healthcare industry. And also follow her on Twitter at Libby C. Watson. And you know, if you enjoy this podcast, you should also check out our Patreon because that's how me and Bob do this as our full-time jobs. At patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons, you can sign up for five bucks a month and get access to a ton of stuff in addition to just feeling good that you're helping me and Bob do this as our full-time jobs. Each month, you get a new episode of Talking Futurama we're going through the third season right now you'd also get access to a giant back catalog that includes us covering shows not just Futurama but also King of the Hill Mission Hill and The Critic plus right now we're going through our top 10 favorite episodes of Batman the animated series each week on Friday you will hear a brand new one until the end of 2021 check it all out one more time at patreon.com slash talking simpsons But if you want something as nice as Napoleon's hat and not the one he's famous for wearing, you need to sign up at the $10 premium level of patreon.com slash talking Simpsons for $10 and up folks. You get all the $5 things I just talked about all those exclusive podcasts and you get one more exclusive podcast that is often over four hours long. That is a what a cartoon movie podcast on our sister podcast what a cartoon me and bob cover an animated series twice a month and if you sign up at the premium level you get to hear the full what a cartoon movie of us talking about an animated feature film films such as the classic holiday special rudolph the red-nosed reindeer disney icons like lion king recent hits like spider-man into the spider-verse even some grown-up old classics like Beavis and Butthead Do America, and tons and tons more. Please sign up today, and you'll be able to hear the December one of us covering the Satoshi Kon masterpiece, Millennium Actress. So many cool things at your disposal at that $10 level. Please sign up today once more. That is at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. <laughs>
But uh, but yeah, this this episode of Simpsons is a real very special episode of a sitcom. It's kind of like we said it about a few others this season, but it definitely feels like in season two they they had too many like tropey sitcom ideas. Mm-hmm. They're like, well, this would be an interesting. Uh, when Flanders failed, uh, that's another good example of like, well, the neighbor is in trouble with his business, and then Homer helps him. Like, there's in the future when they'd start with a trope, the 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 truly classic Simpsons would turn on that trope and be like oh well you thought we were going this way well now or like the simpsons get a new neighbor it's the former president george hw bush yeah that in this case it's like the second you see abe make a new friend you're like well she's dead like she's marked for death this character will not live it's going to be a very special lesson for everyone you know yeah Yeah. i think they got the wrong guys to write this this is uh jay kogan and wally walidarski uh some of the younger writers at the time they were in their mid to late 20s they previously wrote bart the daredevil another story in which the simpsons car goes down the wrong path and it's attacked by animals but in that case it was a robo animal that's right uh but they are like young wacky guys they like sillier scripts and i think they were at a loss for how to put emotion into their scripts so they just handed it to james l brooks Mm -hmm. who wrote one of the most cringe worthy endings of the simpsons to ever have been written sure this is not the simpsons the ending of this show is a different show entirely yes now when i mean we'll get there but when the episode ended i was really thinking like wait where's the joke Mm -hmm. yeah there's it's just how sweet it's like things are sweet yeah it's uh at at the very least in the way we was written around the same time bart ends it by hacking and like choking himself like this disgusts me this cute Mm -hmm. ending but in this case it's like nope just a a, a big old hug of an ending yeah right the the writers weren't able to put themselves into the episode uh, barfing at that point (laughs) yeah and we were talking about like grandpa very soon would become the old man who poops himself who gets his teeth (laughs) stolen by a turtle Mm -hmm. who thinks a porta potty is an elevator who thinks a tool shed is a porta potty uh he's an insane old man but we're led to believe in this episode he's an eloquent old man who finds love and can quote rudyard Kip- kipling at, mm. at the end of this story yeah, yeah it's, and then we learn uh was uh oh brother out there before this or after this, this is before uh, oh brother is before this yeah, okay yeah. so we learn that abe sucks and is awful to women too yeah, in that episode he like abandons a child and who he never even looked for again and just tells homer about offhandedly yeah who, who also is like a crank who goes to movie theaters to complain but like he's not a complaining guy in this he's just like a happy a happy or wistful man yeah right i think making him kind of the protagonist of this episode is is a strange thing because he's such a punchline in in all of the rest of the episodes and, and a really good punchline as well and you know other episodes even that feature that feature grandpa heavily like the sexual inadequacy episode you know (laughs) he's just a completely different character you know he's you're not really uh, on his side at all whereas in this we're entirely supposed to be on his side you know he's got a a rude son who doesn't appreciate him and he lives in a you know dilapidated nursing home and stuff like that you know the flying hellfish episode that also is about surprising you like oh grandpa is not who you think he is but that at least accepts that like yeah grandpa is a joke and everybody is right to laugh at him but sometimes he can get his groove back and remember when he was a war hero <laughs> and he becomes like uh, sergeant rock for one episode and it must be said i mean this is an episode about an old person dying this entire generation of old people is gone now like oh, this is my grandma's yeah. generation oh, uh i think this is like what the silent generation <laughs> yeah no yeah. Uh, i i have no grandparents left either yeah. it's uh, not not to get too bummed about you know death <laughs> but it did make me a little sad because i associate this era of old people with my grandma who i loved mm-hmm. and now i'm like yeah. well all these people are gone now thanks yeah. a lot simpsons <laughs> yeah it's like seeing a photo of an old you know it's the it's the kitty from uh hang in there kitty oh that mm-hmm. cat's long dead yeah <laughs> i i i watched a movie a 1932 movie about the elderly uh for this podcast episode and uh when i watched i thought like, oh these people like were born in 1850 that i'm seeing <laughs> on screen here this is a very old movie i mean people grandpa's age now uh they run for president yes they're yeah. a different class of old people entirely yeah i know when when we talk with bill oakley about like writing grandpa he mentions that like it's just out of time now like when he he would write grandpa stuff he was writing his grandfather who was born before 1900 like that's how old his dad his grandpa was and that's not who abe can be anymore you know they did uh in the last season of simpsons the most recent one they just did an episode that still was about how grandpa was a world war ii vet and it just it can't work anymore like even even if he was drafted at like six 16 that's still he would be almost 100 at that point 
I feel like at this point, I'm the same age that Grandpa Simpson would have to be in <laughs> the current uh, Simpsons. I mean, me and Bob are almost older than Homer. Uh, we consider Homer 39, and we're getting close to being older than Homer Yes, now. Uh, as of this airing, uh, Henry and I are both Homer's age, canonically. Yeah. So the Homer's 36 in the season two episode, so we are older than mm, Homer at this true. moment. Yeah, yeah, that's fucked up. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you're right. Kogan, I think Kogan and Walidarski, they're not the right guys for this, and also this feels like them uh, not trying trying too hard there's a lot of uh, moments in this that just feel like filler to get to a page count they're like well let's uh what if a parade of characters walked in well what if a guy walked over there and then looked at things for like a minute that would cover some time well and i feel bad too that like uh, this is directed by david silverman who like is the best simpsons director ever he directed the movie he's like if anybody gets credit for why the show works in animation it should probably be david silverman like and it, this feels like kind of a way of his abilities to give him the, uh, the, uh, an episode like this one. And, and he, uh, Silverman tells a very funny story on here that I've heard him tell before, but it was like that he was essentially supervising director for the whole series at this time. And on top of that was doing four episodes for the season, plus having to do the Halloween episode. And he said, while working on this episode, they also came up to him and said like, do you think you could direct the Do the Bartman video? Uh. And he says that he very performatively flopped on the ground and started shaking as a way to express how overworked he was feeling in that moment and so uh, eventually they went to brad bird and could convince him to do it and brad bird said he about lost his mind and what an insane uh turnaround and difficult job it was to do the bartman video yeah just to go back to uh to my britishness which is obviously the most interesting thing in the <laughs> world um i i remember watching the the early simpsons because like i it was about season four by the time i started watching it and so you know watching the early simpsons and then references in the simpsons to that kind of early era where it was all like bart craziness and like bart merch and stuff and all those jokes about like oh we wouldn't sell crappy merchandise or whatever that kind of all passed me by because again that didn't <laughs> really happen in the i mean you could get like simpson stuff i had a bart simpson t-shirt or whatever but like i don't think it hit in the same way hmm. that it that it did in the u.s so i was always just like okay what are the, what are they talking about <laughs> so that was one of the many many jokes that i didn't really understand as a kid uh i mean too it's funny they uh, talk about on the commentary they're like oh what are the kids watching this you know the bart show for as far as a child in 1991 is concerned and then it's just all about old people yeah like, there's yeah. very little bart in this and by the way to answer your question from earlier the youngest world war ii vet turned 92 this year okay. because he enlisted at age 13 all right oh, yeah which i which, can't make any promises that yeah. he's still alive <laughs> that was in april that he turned 92 okay uh I think that's just showing off, frankly, en enlisting at 13. What yeah. a nerd. <laughs> Real try hard there, man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, well, and yeah, well, this episode has a big guest star, like a sitcom legend guest star. That's uh, right. Great, great casting, too. I, You know, let's talk about her, I guess, right. when she appears in right. the episode. But uh, I guess to start from the beginning here, we head to the retirement castle as uh, that's where Abe's getting dropped off. And uh, the retirement castle was, you know, first seen in the Thanksgiving episode. I think when, now that we've gone back through season two, I've been noticing more and more where they, you know, they do a one-off gag in, one, in an early in season two thing, and they're like, hey, that could be a whole episode. And I think once they wrote the Thanksgiving episode where Homer visits the retirement castle, they're like, oh, this is really a depressing place. Let's spend more time there <laughs> with it. Let's figure this out. This is actually the first time it's called the retirement castle. I checked previously. It was just called Springfield Retirement Home, but I think uh... it was named Castle in this one to just hide highlight how run down it is but that name would stick after this episode That's so nice. the first time it was called springfield retirement castle is in this episode and also yeah right from the jump abe is totally out of character he wants to be around his family and is sad when they drive away like instead of instead of being an old crank he actually is a guy who's like well bye kids bye and they just drive away like he wants to see his grandchildren that's uh I, though man a trip to the liquor store that's uh, that <laughs> that's pretty bad of them that's pretty low at like, least buy him some booze yeah yeah he, instead of beef jerky yeah <laughs> Yeah, he should be having some uh, the brownest of the brown liquors. That's what stirred he into his mush, yeah, as he says, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so this uh, descriptor descriptors of smells as they drive away when they try to think of what Grandpa smells like. I never saw that one. That wasn't in the syndication mm. cut. Only got to see it in the DVD version because I can see why it it's kind of like needless uh, descriptors of things. But I I like all of those things, like uh, the just what it brings up, like an old chest that's wet at the bottom, like that's. What 
what, yeah. <laughs> that's what he smelled. <laughs> now, my grandfather, he smelled like pipes because he mm. smoked a pipe, mm-hmm. like a lot, of, too, yeah. a lot of tobacco. I, I think of a, a rosy tobacco scent when I think of grandpa. Yeah. I think most grandparents of this vintage did smell like tobacco. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just yeah, by hard default. Yeah, I find one that didn't, I think. <laughs> they were just 100% tobacco. I think for me, it's like the smell of my granddad's car like the the sort of uh, the seat being um the sort you know those like uh really old car seats that were like very fabricy they were mm. like way too kind of soft the fabric was almost like felt you know or velvet or whatever something like that being hot in the sun for me that's the mm. uh, the smell <laughs> grandpa which is much better than a hospital hallway uh, you know i remember yeah that thought as a little kid of like riding riding in my grandparents car like my grandpa drove me somewhere like this doesn't smell like oh cars can smell different like <laughs> Yeah. Just, just that thought. Uh, as they're driving back, they decide like, oh, wait a minute. We're going to grow old someday and we better show the kids how to treat them well. I Maybe that was the first time as a child, too, that I realized like, oh, my parents can grow old and I'll, uh, the grandparent, <laughs> nobody stays the same age all the time. Uh, yeah, this this episode definitely was kind of an introduction to the concept of, of death and also of like old people being able to be sad about death, which is a very specific kind of sadness you know it's like it's not just that you lose your grandparents that but that your you know your grandpa loses his wife kind of thing is mm. is, a, is an extra kind of sadness but yeah they they decide they got to plan something good for abe next time in our, in our first clip you know grandpa kind of smells like that trunk in the garage with the bottoms all wet no uh he smells more like a photo lab stop it both of you Grandpa smells like a regular old man, which is more like a hallway in a hospital. Homer, that's terrible. We should be teaching the children to treasure the elderly. You know, we'll be old someday. (gasps) My God, you're right, Mars. You kids won't put me in a home like I did to my dad, would you? Well... (laughs) (laughs) Mars, what do we do? Mm, Well, I I think we better set an example. Absolutely. Our third Sunday of every month should be a pleasure, not a chore. Where's some place fun we can take Grandpa next time? To the pony ride. No. Yeah. Can't sit on ponies. Well, I always enjoy the glass <laughs> blower at Old Springfield Town. Oh, oh he saw wow. that. Big honor. Hmm. The Museum of Barnyard Oddities. No, oh, Bart. No. Gross. Come on. I've got it. The Springfield Mystery Spot. Oh. That is just um. a dumb mud puddle. <gasps> Ah, lots of fun crosstalk. You can yeah. tell there's some ad libs. They're in the same room. I like it in this era, especially. Oh, I love that. Like uh, Homer, Homer's just saying like he can't ride a pony. Like just <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, it's great. This is stuff like even in classic episodes, you don't get this kind of crosstalk uh, with the characters because the actors aren't like recording together. But this, mm, it, uh, do- it does feel very different. Um, I also love the like very kind of explicit kind of oh shit this can happen to me mm. oh okay well we better do something about it then that is that is good it kind of I, I guess i kind of wasn't paying attention the first time but when i watched the second time i was like oh that's entirely the reason why he worries <laughs> is just because he's all about himself uh it's uh, i i like they write homer is getting stupider every episode and this moment is homer realizing like i'll age i'll be right. old yeah <laughs> This is Lisa written as the pony lover. Mm-hmm, like that's mm-hmm. her main aspect is that she loves ponies. She <laughs> also wants to be cruel to the elderly as well. Yeah, yeah. She she doesn't. Uh, it's not the empathetic Lisa we we know so well. This is just her wanting a pony ride and then the pony. Like she has two pony jokes the same episode. <laughs> and yeah, also the uh, the Springfield mystery spot. You know, I still haven't been to the San Francisco mystery mm. spot. Or well, really, it's I guess it's in Santa Cruz. I think it is. But the you go to the Winchester mystery house instead yeah it's, it's a more fun mystery destination that's true i should have i was just down in san jose to, uh, for some to go to the great america roller coaster place but i should have gone should have checked out that winchester house this was another thing that kind of it didn't exactly pass me by as a kid but it was a little bit confusing because i don't think we really have like roadside attractions in the way that america does in the uk we definitely didn't have mystery spots <laughs> so i was kind of like what is that and like in um season three the the baseball one when you know this 
just like the the bottomless pit or whatever stuff like that i was like it, it just seemed like a completely wacky joke to me i didn't really get that it was like making fun of a thing that existed <laughs> yeah this kind of stunned me when i saw this at the age of uh, eight or nine because there were commercials for a thing like this on tv yeah. nearby i never went to it and i think the biggest risk that you uh, run by going to one of these is having a monkey rip the antenna off your car mm-hmm, i mm-hmm. mean i'm sure a lion can kill you if you get out of your car and taunt sure, it i'm sure, sure. like a I zebra think I saw a video yeah. of a man being attacked that by did a lion to us. These... Oh. we did we did go to a, a discount line safari in oh, the uk really? we didn't have mystery spots but we did have discount line safaris Ooh. and a monkey did rip the antenna off our car and it was wow. very funny it really happens and these mm-hmm. those monkeys are just collecting antennas at what point do you have enough <laughs> antennas monkeys like what's yeah. what's their long game with yeah. this antenna plan <laughs> It's just a currency for them. You know, they're trading it for bananas or whatever. <laughs> I feel like every one of these is a Joe Exotic situation and there's like a big lion graveyard somewhere we're not seeing. Oh, totally. Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. no, thinking thinking about that now is, is very grim. Woburn Safari Park that we used to go to near my, my grandma's house. It was definitely uh, not, not in good shape. The Tiger King documentary demystified a lot of that for us. Now, anytime I see, uh, like on a talk show, they bring in like, oh, it's a big cat and here's our guest who, who owns the cat. And I think like, well, you have to run drugs or have uh, be a bigamist or you were just in jail for uh, for like spousal abuse. Something is wrong. Some, with some you. sort of cult. Yeah, a cult. Definitely yeah. a cult is there. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, only zoo I trust these days is the the National Zoo in DC. Anything else, I, I really don't I really don't like to think about. Uh, also, you know, these bits here would be set up for later jokes. They would do, you know, the, all this pony stuff would be an episode. But also, uh, Old Springfield Town and the glass blower, like in I Mary Marge, Homer works as a candle maker hmm. in Old Springfield Town, uh, making a really crappy candle. As as one child cries, uh, I really do like the shot. There's some really good animation here that silverman gets in like the shot of all of them screaming discount lion safari i really like that huge drawing. open mouths yeah <laughs> just seeing everybody in the car talking at once again feels very uh it feels early it does uh, but then we get abe uh he's gr- angrily dropping his jerky in his jerky drawer that's all it's filled to the brim with jerky it's a lot of jerky and not I don't even have yeah i don't even have that many socks <laughs> in my sock drawer also for a guy with false teeth i don't know jerky is a tough chew i i feel like somebody <laughs> with dentures shouldn't you shouldn't give them jerky i I can't make out what he's muttering as he throws the jerky in the uh cabinet or the drawer rather but it's something about his teeth oh yeah maybe Mm -hmm. maybe he is complaining about his teeth there (laughs) yeah Yeah. next time you should get a a baby ruth bar or something i Mm. think <laughs> uh, just well, I mean, that's again why he's on a, a steady diet of mush uh, going onward. <laughs> I think for Abe, a nice, smooth three musketeers, nothing chewy uh, in that, just full of delicious foam, or whatever yeah, they put in it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, as, uh, as we get a walk through the very sad retirement castle, there's some really fun and wild designs of the elderly here. Like it's it's where some of the biggest freaks of season two's background design come to play, and I I love that. I something about the wonkiness; of these old ones feel really you know warm and fuzzy to me i feel nostalgic for him but even on the you know the 2002 or 2003 commentary graining's just you know whining like ah some of these people they don't look right look at that beard line that we wouldn't have a guy like that there <laughs> yeah they did not eliminate all the freaks yet from their uh, character packages mm-hmm. here but uh, yeah they, they really come out the shine in the old folks home I look closest at the snail lady I think of is in her like her neck looks like <laughs> she just has like a basically shell of a body and a neck that pokes out of it. But yes, we then head over to get in the pills and this is when we have a real meet cute uh, here between these old folks. Hey, these are my pills. Now, now, Mr. Simmons, don't make me call Nurse Bronski. <laughs> Good Simpson, damn it! And these aren't my oh, pills! Uh, excuse me, nurse. My name is Simmons, and I think I have the wrong pills. I get two red ones for my back spasms, a yellow one for my arrhythmia, and two of the bluest eyes I've ever seen in my life. Uh, then these must be... And I have your... They, they must have... have. Oh, <laughs> 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 Look at us. We're staring at each other like a couple of stupid punk teenagers. Oh, I wasn't staring. It's uh, my lazy eye. I'm Beatrice Simmons, but my friends call me B. Well, I'm Abraham J. Simpson. Care to tip the wrist with me? Oh, I would be delighted. 
So that's Audrey Meadows, a mm-hmm. sitcom legend. She played Alice Cramden in The Honeymooner. So it's sort of a passing of the torch. Yeah. And apparently she was lots of fun and totally in on it. Yeah. She sounded like a real good time, like telling them old stories about working on The Honeymooners, like the exact person you'd want her to be coming in. And yeah, I mean, uh, reading up on her, you know, she lived about four years after this episode aired. Uh, and- she died in 96 yeah. uh, of throat cancer. You can tell she's a heavy smoker just by yes. her voice. So that's exactly what killed her. But uh, a huge uh, career yeah. in Hollywood. Again, this is kind of like with Doris Grau, but in both cases, it's like, uh, I feel, I know that obviously the, the parties were fine with it. The actors were like, yeah, I'll cough. I'll do a, a stage cough. But uh, now thinking about like a person who died of smoking related illnesses being told like, hey, cough, no cough harder and sicker right now. Uh, <laughs> I, I feel bad for them. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Aubrey Meadows is awesome. And I think she has really good chemistry with Dan Castle it, mm-hmm. it feels like they recorded together like her like it feels at least he doesn't feel like grandpa but dan is playing an old man very well who's who's befriended her mm-hmm. which i i think is very sweet and i mean it makes sense that she is b simmons and he is abe simpson so their names would be right next to each other in the chart but how many people have died from miss <laughs> wrong, the wrong pills being given to this fo- uh, retirement castle yes i also love the just like immediate threat that she issues like that they're gonna they're gonna call nurse bronsky or who apparently <laughs> you know is, is someone to be terrified of in that you know sickly sweet voice you know i'm mm-hmm. gonna call the nurse to abuse you it feels like it's the nurse ratchet of this establishment yes. mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah yeah, Libby, I was I was going to ask in your in your career, uh, I would guess you've probably seen much worse stories about elder care than uh, than is is visible in this episode. Well, absolutely, yeah. I mean, that's kind of the thing of this episode is it's just like taken as a given that retirement homes and nursing homes are just horrible places where people go to where where the uh, elderly go to ignore the inevitable, but also um, horrible places to live that are in bad condition and uh, you know where people are poorly treated by staff. Or- or, or whatever um it is it is kind of a grim uh, i guess setting for this uh, for this whole thing to happen and and yeah i mean it is obviously a, a thing where you know nurses and staff do mix up meds and give people the wrong meds and uh you know just kind of like take advantage of, of patients and, and and are also themselves like hugely overworked and underappreciated and un- underpaid so it's it's a good it's certainly a good setting for like this very sad story um (laughs) and it does kind of make the ending kind of even more kind of grim you know i mean it's meant to be you know super sweet and nice but the ending is like oh you finally get to live in a place that's not awful (laughs) you know it's it's really it's really not really not nice to think about and the jokes would only get darker yeah after this point about this place (laughs) sure well, and the year, I mean, the decades now of Retirement Castle jokes, like, they, they are jokes made by men, uh, mostly men, who uh, as writers on the show, uh, who, you know, were joking about, like, oh, it, isn't it funny that this happens to the elderly? We'll never be old someday. And I think now, as they're approaching that age, they're like, oh, these, <laughs> I, I think they've lightened up a little on the uh, the crazy old man jokes in the yeah. show that they used to make in their in their 30s. <laughs> I, I definitely used to find and still do find all of the, the jokes about like ignoring the elderly and, and stuff like I mean The Simpsons is obviously like often very kind of biting and those ones often do bite me just a little bit too hard like the one where uh, Abe goes to pick up uh, Marge's mum and he <laughs> brings out the wrong woman and, <laughs> and he goes back to get her and she says can I come too that one just that one hurts me so much that's a really that's a really tough one but i don't know i kind of in a way like when uh, when they treat the 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 retirement castle in in later seasons as you know with the the kind of blase you know like yeah this uh, this is you know they're really they're really dark about it i I don't know i kind of feel like better about that than this like shocky thing that they do in this episode where they're really kind of hammering it home and then at the end it's like oh okay now you now i guess you get to you get to live in a nice place if someone happens to luck into a hundred thousand dollars or whatever <laughs> mm-hmm. uh there's, there's something about the later ones that i guess don't necessarily like hurt in the same way it's just like treated as, as a joke like everything else well also to think that even homer would visit a 
once a month is like well now that's there's there's so many jokes about i'll ne- i never visit him that he even comes mm-hmm. over at christmas and they close the blinds <laughs> on him to pretend <laughs> right. they're not home but yeah this this sequence here is you know i feel like they needed to up it just a little bit more but the joke is this is like a romantic comedy yeah. moment but it's with two very old people in it and the closest thing to a joke is them going like them having the little chuckle to themselves and then they fall into a hacking fit but and yeah. then they do this extended parody of a movie that was uh, not very well known at the time and I don't think anyone would know it now I only know it because it's on the commentary this whole pill eating scene is a uh, reference to the movie Tom Jones from 1963 in mm-hmm. which people uh, a woman and a man are seated, uh, seated across from each other at a table and they're trying to one up each other by being like sexy with non-sexy foods mm-hmm. and there's like a lot of gross chewing and crunching and eating noises and it goes on for a long time that scene is on YouTube if you want to check it out but that is a parody or that is a reference to uh, that scene in Tom Jones a scene of Grandpa and B sexually eating their pills to the point where they intertwine arms and drink the little cup of water that's also from Tom Jones right right I- that makes sense because it really is quite difficult to watch it does go on for quite a long time <laughs> it's too scene. long yeah mm-hmm. i it's you know it's funny this in season two they got all these ideas of like oh we can do like shot for shot parodies of films let's do the birds or let's do psycho they, that was the big one you know or or tons of citizen kane ones but when they do tom jones that was the one that just flew by because that's not in everybody's memory the same as as a hitchcock or a kubrick film i guess too with uh, tom jones the only what I know it for two things is that it was a Best Picture winner. Oh, okay. Uh, because I worked at a video store that had a wall of just like every Best Picture winner. Here it is. And so every time I put Tom Jones there, I'd be like, oh, right. There it is. Tom Jones. And then I also know it because I did see the film Big Fish, uh, the Tim Burton movie. And Albert Finney plays the elderly father in it. And uh, Ewan McGregor plays him in the flashbacks. And they made Ewan up to look as much like Albert Albert Finney in Tom Jones as they could okay. to make it uh, match the ages. So if you want to see when Albert Finney was a handsome man, uh, you could also look up Tom Jones as well. But I guess, too, he identifies himself as Abe Simpson or Abraham J. Simpson. That's the the first here as well. Yeah, that was the first time they named the character. And I don't think he was named officially before this because uh, Matt Groening said, you know, Homer's named after my dad. Uh, Lisa's my sister. Marge uh, is the mom. Yeah, Maggie's like, the other sister. Yeah. It's all about my family. So I'm, I want you to name uh, Grandpa. I'll leave the room. They name him Abe. Abe is the name of Matt Groening's grandfather and it's also the name of his future child yes yeah or perhaps the child born around this time uh, so I, I looked that up yeah he uh, his that was his grandfather's name he Matt Groening had his first son in 1990 uh, and his second son born in 1993 is Abraham Groening the his, his son and that that son would go on to be a writer's assistant for disenchantment who uh, wrote one of the episodes in the third season so uh, that's Stay and staying in the family. That episode is a good one. That uh, that a when I saw that Abe Graining wrote it, I was like, oh, that that makes sense because it's an episode about being a rich kid like that and and worrying that everyone hates you secretly and no one's everyone's a fake friend like uh, when i saw that abe graining wrote that episode i was like that's interesting that's uh, you you can follow abe graining on twitter he's on twitter if you want to mm. give him a follow well i can tell you matt graining has a lot more kids after that with another partner he yes. needs to make uh, more shows <laughs> they all need writing uh, jobs well you know that's another like 10 years they, they were just born in the in the 2010s those kids he has a lot of little blonde children now <laughs> Well, lucky for them, they won't ever have to worry about, you know, whether to, to put him in a home or whatever. At least they'll at least they'll have the money to put him in a nice one. That's <laughs> true. Yeah. Great. Matt Groening, uh, like he could he could own 17 retirement castles today if he wanted to <laughs> to live in. I, I remember Dana Gould, when we interviewed him, he joked like, oh, yeah, Matt Groening, uh, he's he's a very relaxed guy. He's a billionaire. Of course, he's relaxed. <laughs> like. <laughs> Abe also jokes that he has one working kidney, which that does not fit with later continuity, where uh, Abe has actually two amazing kidneys that then explode when Homer won't let him use the bathroom. <laughs> you know, a real goof him up there, Simpson. Somebody should have been fired. 
for that nobody blunder. wants to remember that episode henry <laughs> yes yeah I kidney know. trouble i hate that ki- well there's funny stuff in that one on the honey bunch and all that but i homer is just so mean to him it's so crazy to think of yeah. that episode in relation to this episode in this episode homer goes i miss my daddy yeah <laughs> uh but uh also to give you some scary perspective on things uh so when this was recorded Audrey Meadows was 69. It's Audrey Meadows, Henry. Uh, Respect sorry. the dead. Audrey Meadows. She was 69. Dan Castellaneta was 33. Wow. He is now 64. So he is close to the age of the old woman he acted with in the 90s. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, that but, hurts. That one I don't like. <laughs> hopefully he has many uh, more years left. Many, many years. Yeah. You know, I don't, uh, I, I bet he is not as avid a smoker as Meadows was. Mm-mm. So he's got, he looked very healthy the one time we saw him like two years years ago so uh abe then asks her out i thought it's kind of cute how he's like it, but it doesn't fit for abe that he's like bashful or worried about asking out a girl in his old age but i i at least like that she says like sitting alone in my room uh, well if you got he got plans already <laughs> uh, although he does need advice later on for uh from homer about uh, getting with um marge's mom that's right he learns to play it cool <laughs> don't smooch her like a mule eating an apple <laughs> that's the wrong way to go he lost all his game he actually yeah. has some game in this episode where he like seems to remember what it was to date a woman <laughs> but uh yeah afterwards he loses that but he he also hums a song as he's getting ready for his date uh when he pulls out his lucky lindy palmade uh and i finally know what that song is that he's humming it's the uh, 1917 hit dark town strutters ball by wow. shelton Brooks. Uh, I assume Dan is just ad-libbing something, but it had to be real. I would think Dan knows old-timey stuff enough to know this old-timey song. And old enough, they wouldn't have to pay for it. uh, Here, why don't we give it a little listen to the Section Abe Sings. I'll be down to get you in the taxi, honey. You better be ready about a half past eight. Now, baby, don't be late. I want to be there when the band starts playing. Remember, when we get there, honey, the two steps, I'm going to have them all. I'm going to dance off both my shoes when they play the jelly roll. There we go. That reminds me, like, we had an old neighbor who I would visit because he lived alone. He was a widower, and we just were nice to him. And, the, like, this was the radio station he listened to. All the songs sounded like this. Uh, the one where you have to dance with your fingers One finger in the, in the air, area. Yeah. <laughs> it's important to remember, I think, when uh, when people say, like, oh, music these days is so terrible. you got Cardi B and stuff, and music used to be great. And it's like, no, it used to be shit like this. Uh, just all one idea. Yeah, the, uh, I, I, I also think, you know, it's an appropriate song for Abe to sing because he's about to meet a girl for a date to go dancing so you know it, it fits it, uh, though he just has to go to the next room over to to see her uh I'll say yeah, I didn't know what pomade was as a kid I would I would learn later I've I'm not I'm not much of a pomade guy but uh didn't didn't that in, in when it became a thing for dudes to be a madman madman style guy mm. didn't pomade start coming back into the in the, into use yeah definitely I yeah. think so when we we were watching this my my husband was like what the hell is pomade and i was like i don't know some kind of goo you put in your hair you know 50s guys they slick their hair back and mm-hmm. you know they look like they dunk their head in a vat of chip fat or whatever it's because you only washed your hair every two weeks back then mm-hmm. right well you see soap was expensive back then after <laughs> the war so hey now that's coming back around again you know to be the cool to be a cool person is to not bathe to be stinky like yeah. jake gyllenhaal yeah to be as stinky as jake gyllenhaal people only don't point it out because he's rich he doesn't yeah. understand yeah, that <laughs> <laughs> there's a whole trendy you know don't wash your hair thing but i'm always getting bombarded with ads on instagram about how you shouldn't wash your hair too often because it makes it more dirty or whatever and i'm like okay Okay, but even if that was true i don't have three months to sit around waiting for my hair to heal itself or whatever i'm just gonna keep washing it thanks <laughs> uh and so uh abe and b head out for a dance the larry davis experience returns and is playing some music and yes larry davis once again named after jay kogan's high school geometry teacher mm-hmm. so every time you see them just remember that and you won't see them often because they kind of disappear after this there's a lot of characters that if they first appeared in a kogan and waladarsky and it's a random name you find out it's like well yeah that was that person's friend 
like like John Frank, like John Frank in this episode. Yeah. And the embrace me song sequence, like it's very sweet and all, but it's it's too sweet for the Simpsons. Like there's no extra joke to it. Yeah. I don't know if the joke of them on like a tropical beach is supposed to be. Well, I mean, the scene of them there. Is that a joke? I don't know. It feels like the heightening of the pedestrian things they were doing before. But there's no like real jokes in this. But maybe yeah. they just wanted to play it seriously because you have to be invested in Abe to feel for him when this woman dies. Well, and that's the other thing is, uh, you know, I was thinking like the actual sequence where they, you know, the, the montage where they're, where they're dating, it, it does feel kind of truncated. You know, we're supposed to kind of get the sense that they are dating and in love and that, it, you know, that it'll be very sad when she dies. But it's actually a very short amount of time. And, you know, she only dies like halfway into the episode or something. So we don't really get that much time with her at all. Yeah, it's supposed to be a month because mm-hmm. Homer uh, will right. take Abe out every month and then he meets B right after Homer dumps him back at the home again. Mm-hmm. So maybe they needed another act together or something in this episode. Yeah, but they, they got to speed it up. They got to kill. The point is for her to die, <laughs> not to live uh, p- uh, plot wise. Yeah, no, I mean, that these are the dangers in these shows. Any very special episode like, you know, in the 80s, they this was used a lot more. But like I think of Full House episodes where right you know they can only have like three minutes of michelle tanner or stephanie befriending some kid who has a problem before then it's about the problem and the kid goes like well yeah my dad hits me or they they find out an old man has senility and and then it's the episodes about that you don't you don't get much time to hang out when in a purpose-driven episode like that which is too bad that the sims like the i guess the joke in this is that it's meant to feel more like a month like they're dating for like six months or something Mm. and uh, I guess you know B's got all this money uh, she can take them to Hawaii pretty easy I guess though the why is she staying in such a crappy retirement home if she has all this money that's that's what I'm confused about hmm. yeah that's that's a good point and she's <laughs> certainly not on Medicaid because to get Medicaid to pay for your nursing home you have to be basically broke so uh, I don't know why it's such a bad nursing home absolutely Wow, that's uh, that's depressing. Mm-hmm. That's, that's one of the depressing facts you can learn in in sick oh. note. Yeah, it's- <laughs> I've got hundreds of those. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean the uh, the song is it's sweet and all, but uh, and then maybe I'll even drop it in here. Embrace me, my sweet embraceable you. Embrace me. You irreplaceable you Don't be a naughty baby Come to Papa, come to Papa, do My sweet embraceable you Then in the next scene, Abe is going birthday shopping uh, for her and we we head back to Herman's uh, this, place this the last grandpa and Herman scene might be it might be because man. they were a pair it was established that this is who grandpa talks to yeah. uh, like an unhinged middle-aged man who <laughs> would probably go on to have like a militia or have some mm-hmm. at least some sort of standoff is in his future right oh totally no I I said it before but it looks like if you wink at him he will show you the Nazi memorabilia he had <laughs> hides for special customers <laughs> Yeah, he'd be a proud boy these days for sure. Well, that's that's the funny thing that I I like about their friendship and I wish they'd have kept because Abe, you know, is this man out of time. He's a World War II vet. Uh, like he's, and th- that that he'd fall into like, oh, who be a guy who like him? A crazy gun collector. Like that's who, who has the Confederate flag up in his place. He'd be like, yeah, I respect you. Uh, you are the greatest generation. But it it's also great that on the commentary, Walidarski instantly shouts out when he sees Herman like, oh, that's Schwarzwalder. That's John Schwarzwalder <laughs> right there on screen. And then they kind of one up him back because they're like, oh, well, actually you looked exactly like auto back then <laughs> and we based auto on you and then he's like hey guys don't let's not bring that up he's <laughs> he's a little cute. sensitive about it i think too because he's like uh, he doesn't have that hair no more wally walidarski i uh, he actually if you want to know what wally walidarski looks like if you've seen the darjeeling limited film uh he's the uh bald man that owen wilson keeps yelling at in the movie and and, and makes fun of for being bald that's who wally walidarski is did you know that he is the writer of those dog movies uh, a dog's purpose and a dog's journey he's on some weird movies that's weird yeah uh, yeah is, is, is he born again that feels 
feels like a born again thing to write uh, mm. dog movies about how g- great dogs are. Well, uh, the dogs weren't doing so great on those movie sets. I'll tell you that much. Oh, right. That's right. I don't think Wally Wall- I don't think Wally Waldarski was implicated. No, but no. Uh, hard name to say. But yes, he was in the Darjeeling Limited playing Brendan. Brendan. Yes. And of course, the director of Sorority Boys. We pointed it out before. Right. Right. Wow. What a weird. What a weird. When they when him and Kogan split, they went in very different directions. Uh, work wise uh but yes as as abe is shopping in the wrong place he gets directed to the right one let's take a look at the bayonet case huh hey what's that (laughs) that my friend was napoleon's hat. it doesn't look like napoleon's hat well it's not the famous hat it's the one he wore for a week in april 1796 just before he defeated the sardinians Ooh, how much four hundred dollars yeah i'll give you five bucks it's not the kind of offer you should make to a man with a gatling gun under the counter why don't you try Grandma's World? Yo, activewear? I need a price check on a wool shawl. Yeah, the, uh, the you know, I think they thought Grandma's World was going to be funnier than it was. There aren't <laughs> enough Grandma jokes. And, of course, all of the design jokes in the background are associated with the old people of this era. So all the things on sale are things like doilies, picture frames, uh, seashell soap, sachets, <laughs> and potpourri. All things my grandma uh, trafficked mm. in. Sachets is really good. That's mm-hmm. a really good one because it's yeah. so nonspecific. <laughs> I yeah, you know, potpourri was such a thing with with my <laughs> my uh, my oh. mom and stepdad. They don't give a shit about potpourri. Like they they're they're more into collecting uh, like driftwood or shark teeth. My mom loves collecting shark teeth. That's her favorite. Thing. Uh, potpourri was the forbidden soup. You must uh, never drink of the potpourri <laughs> in the little crock pot. I never knew what that thing was in a, in a house as a kid. It confused the hell out of me, and I'd want to touch it because I was a curious young lad, but. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't even know where you would go to buy potpourri these days, other than mm. the internet. That's what Grandma's World is for. That's yeah. what. Yeah. No. I, uh, and yeah, Bob, you are very right that the Herman's line there is incredibly ADR. They're like, we need Herman to tell. It's not clear enough that he goes to Grandma's World after striking out at Herman's. We need Herman <laughs> to tell him. And hey, yeah, try Grandma's World. Uh, I did like the line. This is the only store I know. That was that was funny, <laughs> and that makes sense in the context of of them having a little friendship. I I didn't really know about that because i haven't really seen season one or two since i was a teenager i'm i sort of strictly do three through nine so i like i like the implication of abe's world being that small i like that that he has literally no one else to talk to it's it's herman and jasper i guess you know really this episode is when jasper comes into his own as abe's good friend Mm -hmm. and that's that's when you don't need herman anymore I can tell both of you that uh, both potpourri and sachets are widely available on Amazon. So uh, the Amazon kicked the grandma's world out of business. As, as they very did sad, so many things. Sad. Yeah, oh, that's sad. Yeah. Uh, also, the guy doing the price check, it's one of those. Uh, he was the same surly cashier as in the uh, Homer versus Lisa and the Eighth Commandment who does a uh, price check on grapes. <laughs> he, was, grape. he was fired for being Go rude to Marge. measly grapes. <laughs> <laughs> He's, uh, you know, they, they, he, you think he'd come back more. But he's one of those, uh, like, he's not as enduring even as uh, just stamp the ticket guy. Like, that guy lasted, outlasted him. <laughs> we leave Grandma's world. Homer arrives. And uh, as he picks up Abe, I uh, this also is just very different of their relationship. Like, he's just very condescending to Abe. And you're supposed to be on Abe's side here. Dad, it's the third Sunday of the month. You know what that means? <laughs> no way. Oh, come on, Dad. I promise we'll have more fun this time. We're going to see lions. I can't go. It's my girlfriend B's birthday. Oh, you have a girlfriend. <laughs> well, happy birthday, B. <laughs> she can come with us. Hey, there's room for all your friends in the car. <laughs> no, she's not invisible, you idiot. She, it's her birthday tonight. Yeah, right. Hey, you kid, stop kicking the seat. I'm kicking the seat. Dad, don't you want to know where we're going? No. This Discount Lion Safari. Damn these childproof doors. <laughs> Hello. That'll be 1850, Blana. Do not feed animals. Do not allow animals in the car. Do not make eye contact with animals. Are we in Africa yet? Hey, didn't anybody knows this place sucks? It seems <laughs> most of the animals are sleeping. Well, let them sleep on their own time. 
that bark comment makes me laugh really hard when I hear it. It's just so flat and blunt. And I think that's what parents were afraid of. Bart is teaching my kids to sass back just yeah. like this. I bet Absolutely. I, I bet I probably quoted that or just like, hey, this place isn't instantly fun. You didn't take <laughs> me to a fun place. Like, yeah. If, were you entertained, Libby, on, on a similar trip like this or did, did, it, did it feel boring? Uh, my memory is of loving it, but that doesn't mean that that's accurate. Uh, that could easily be a <laughs> false memory. I, I loved all zoo and zoo related things as a mm. kid, so I'm sure I was excited to go, even if uh, even if the monkeys were asleep when they weren't tearing our car area off. <laughs> it is a consistent thing in Homer's character that he does not like seeing sleeping animals <laughs> and wants to wake them up. It pisses him off that anyone would sleep. I also, you know, I think about this every time I watch this episode. It's really sad that Bee dies on her birthday. Like yeah. that's, that's extra sad to me. <laughs> I was thinking about it, and I assume B would have died even if Abe was there. So would it have been worse if Abe watched her die? Would that be more traumatizing than missing it? I think he wanted to be there for her last moments Mm. and and help comfort her. And the fact that he wasn't there, like, that is what what really hurts him in that. But, which, again, is an emotional depth to Abe you're not normally used to thinking about. Yeah, I was kind of thinking about this, actually, because, I mean, not to get too grim, but my mom died a few months ago, and so I have kind of been when I was watching it I was kind of thinking about this like concept of of death and like how important it feels for Abe to have missed those moments and how that is kind of a bit of an illusion because the thing that is really sad is that the person died and so you know in her absence I'm sure it's a lot like oh I've missed her last moments blah 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 and it's like I think I think we kind of impute more importance to that than than we hmm. than there really mm. is because we don't have any control over death and so in those moments it feels like those like very last moments you know how much you can have an effect on it matters more than it that it really does mm. man that's very poetic yeah, that's <laughs> a, i uh, <laughs> uh it's uh yeah i think i i think for abe that it, you know you think you want to be there for every single moment of it so i guess that's why abe feels that way or all oh, it's he's just you know trying to find whatever reason he can to blame his his son for what he did it's very frustrating that that moment where you know abe can't get homer to listen that he doesn't want to go and it's like one of those classic kind of sitcom moments where for the story to work the way it does it's it, it's just kind of not possible for humans to have like a real conversation you know i remember <laughs> watching Frasier a lot as a kid and I'm always like just fucking talk about it if you just talk about it for one second <laughs> yeah. then this whole episode would fall apart and you would have it like a normal human interaction here you know and in this situation it's like ho- like Homo would have to at some point l- listen or Abe would be able to like you know physically resist Homer and say like no I am staying for this party you know I think that's why I was frustrated by this as a kid where uh, you cut from Abe saying he won't go to just him in the car I Mm. wish there would have been some sort of larger trick in play here to get him into the car but yeah you're right like there had to be a conversation and Homer had to not hear it Mm -hmm. or he had to teleport Abe into the car I don't know how Abe got into the car or against his will <laughs> there could be a scene where homer lies and say like really yeah. this will only take a couple hours we'll be back in time for your thing instead it's just homer very cruelly doesn't believe b exists he's just like well yeah yeah you're a crazy old man there's no and the cut to abe's angry face when uh, homer's like oh there's room for all your friends in here and like abe is just pissed to, to be so belittled by his son which again is not an emotion they play in the show nor Normally with Abe, like you don't, you're not, you don't empathize with Abe being mad. He's not being taken seriously. Like to take a moment for his emotional, his feelings is is not uh, usually done in the show. Right. The only other time I can really think of of you know uh, dealing with Abe as an old guy is uh, when he he decides to get a job um, at Krusty Burger because he <laughs> feels like a, a a useless old man and that ends with him being like no actually it's cool to be a useless old man so you know it's it's a totally different kind of spin on that that uh, feeling and uh, Homer drives off the path and they're all bouncing around on the road I uh, Silverman uh, talks about how him and his team worked hard and having the family like bump at different times realistically mm-hmm. so because like well the front bumps and then the back goes so it should be these up and them up I it's, it's one of those you know details that don't really come in uh, you don't super notice until someone points it out but I, I like that and mm-hmm. The, the family's car has been destroyed many times. It's also funny. <laughs> Kogan and Waldersky wrote the last time it got destroyed by Truckosaurus. Now it's getting ripped apart by, by animals. It's the same car, right? It's the, uh, the yeah. pink car. Yeah. 
and uh and when they get surrounded by animals and the uh, the lion lays on top of the car i really do like the big worm tongue scream like anytime their big wiggly worm tongues come out and scream i i love that i also really like in that scene how uh the the, the lion surrounding the car happens so suddenly and then at some point they're just eating a zebra on top of the car <laughs> yeah. and it's just like appears there like where the hell did they get this zebra is it like another attraction at the, <laughs> at the safari park that they just killed and ate it's really good yeah yeah, actually, that's not how it should be at a zoo that you yeah. that a, a lion can kill a, a zebra. That shouldn't be happening. <laughs> There's a reason right, it should be eating expired meat from Walmart, like in Tiger King. Exactly, yeah. and then later you feed it to your employees. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so the Simpsons are there all night. You know, uh, Dan is Abe does a uh, great l- forlorn scream of oh me. And then again, in something that feels very old, even in 1991, a Doctor Livingston, I presume, joke. Mm-hmm. Like I think of those jokes as being in like old Bugs Bunny cartoons. <laughs> yeah. Like no, no, I only knew it as a Bugs Bunny thing. No, no child in 1990 knew the story of dr livingston uh, lost in the africa and, and being found like i mean also it's just like depressing and colonialist and mm-hmm. it's like you know I, oh, you don't want to hear about it these days yeah to, to this day i have to confess that that reference went completely over my head i was like why is this guy british this doesn't make any sense <laughs> i thought they just liked doing the british voice because it was funny uh now yeah it's it's a reference to a, a very old thing yeah know? and and so then yeah act one one ends with like the very special episode act one played really entirely straight ahead forward like there's one kind of joke in it but uh i mean even as a little kid when i see a scene start with an ambulance outside somewhere i know bad stuff's coming but yes uh, abe abe learned some sad news in this next clip out of my way i got a date with an angel you don't know how right you are abe what? I'm sorry to be the one to tell you this, but uh, B passed away last night. Oh, no. It was her ticker. The doc said her left ventricle burst. Oh, no, Jasper. Amy says she died of a burst ventricle, but I know she died of a broken heart. Which, uh, I guess, I mean, the joke is that a burst ventricle mm. is a broken heart. That's the that's the joke. I think her health but... problem was unrelated to uh, yeah. her being stood up on that date, kind she, of. Yeah, why would she? I mean, yeah, Abe not showing up. I mean, somebody, like, when Abe is pulled out of the place, he couldn't tell Jasper, like, hey, tell B I'll be late, or, like, right. I'm going to be on this thing. Like, how did... I? Also, the character B is written as, to this point, wouldn't be the type of person to be like, oh, Abe has abandoned me. Oh, I can't take it. It's so painful. Like, that... She's a very, like, breezy, fun lady. Like, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I guess Abe is just blaming himself guiltily. You know, that's that's uh, yeah, death affects us all in different ways. I guess. Yeah, it is. It is a really sad moment, and I do, I do remember that particular thing when I was a kid. That like particular concept of, uh, you know, B dies thinking that Abe stood her up or whatever. That really got me. That really hurt my my little uh, mm. child feelings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I I like to think that you know B. Well, B seems fine when she's a ghost later, and I I take that as not as as an actual ghost from heaven and not a vi- not like a, a crazy vision that Abe has. For some reason, she's doomed to walk the earth as a ghost. We don't know what she uh, did. She seems pretty. Well, they fi- have a haunting a they have a haunting a family in Texas. Mm. So. Yeah, but why why would God cur- curse her to that? <laughs> her her work on earth is not done. Yeah, uh, you know maybe maybe she did. Uh, be- she was a different person before B- uh, Abe met B. Maybe she maybe there's some dark stuff in her <laughs> past. You know. That she must atone for. Where's the body of Ralph Cramden? Yeah, honestly, yes. Yeah. So maybe she <laughs> killed her husband in Texas, and then in that old house, and then she she moved up to Springfield to get away from that and forget. For me, I just I like the idea that uh, <laughs> that when you die, this is kind of a bored guy behind a desk who's like, "All right, you're in uh, Texas. There you go," and that everybody gets assigned to some, <laughs> to haunt some family. I like that. I like you can that. occasionally just jump on roller coasters. Yeah, single rider though. <laughs> you get single uh, rider line. You you put in your hours uh, in Texas and then occasionally get a weekend off to just float to where you want to and visit people. <laughs> right, that's that's your Department of Labor mandated fifteen minute break you, you <laughs> to, to go see your your boyfriend. Oh man, I would go on Space Mountain. Mm, oh yeah, every day. Just <laughs> like, oh, if I can just teleport anywhere. Yeah, mm. uh, <laughs> I'd be you know I do pirates and then uh, actually I would guess when I'm a ghost I would be less 
less into Haunted Mansion than I am now. I like the Haunted Mansion now, but if I was really a ghost, I'd, I'd think it'd be played off or maybe even insensitive to you my... You would say, this is so unrealistic. We don't do this much ballroom dancing. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but yes, we we cut to the funeral. Uh, we get to see Hans Mole Man is ar- among the pallbearers with her. I do like this gag of Homer thinking that that his father has gone deaf. As as we get a reference to the 1980 version of the jazz oh, singer boy. in this in this next clip. I can't tell you how sorry I am, Dad. Is someone talking to me? I didn't hear anything. Oh no, Dad lost his hearing. Uh, no, you idiot. I'm ignoring you. You made me miss the last precious moment of B's life. I'll never speak to you again. I have no son. So there you go. As as famously said uh, in in the 1980 version of Jazz Singer by uh, Lawrence Olivier, Lawrence, good old Lawrence Oliver, that to uh, Neil Diamond. I didn't say, yeah, I I believe the story was on that film that Neil Neil Diamond, you know, really wanted Olivier to work on the film, and he said he'd do it as long as he didn't have to do any promotion for it. He hmm. would just show up and and leave. <laughs> Uh, I I have the original version. If you want to hear how, oh that, sure, because uh, the way Abe says it is how you remember the line in your head. But it's if you actually can pull up the scene on YouTube, you're like, ah, it's not exactly the the way he says it here. No, no, I have no son. <laughs> and That's he rips a... his garment because yeah. uh we covered this a long time ago but i didn't know this i didn't know what this reference was why is ape tearing his clothes i guess in the jewish tradition you uh when you hear the news of somebody dying you tear the cloth over your heart or something like that mm-hmm. you rend your garment yes yeah I... and that's why he does it and uh kogan and waladarsky will the reference will return in like father like clown next year mm-hmm. so the, the much more explicit jazz singer uh parody they kogan and waladarsky they're like we're not done with this jazz singer no no sir no way <laughs> were they into this movie because it was bad this version of it i think so okay i, th- I think it was famously like a, well because i mean like neil diamond's no good actor and like why and then the i i would think even in 1980 it's funny to think of like oh yeah that old blackface movie the food the movie that's famous for blackface let's let's remake it for 1980 <laughs> Uh, I, I've heard it. I've never watched the film. I've heard it's a, a classic bad film. I mean, to also have like Laurence Olivier, one of the most like celebrated actors of all time in such a bad movie. Probably that's part of the appeal, mm. too. Uh, so it's post funeral. Abe's crying. Uh, and that's when we get the return of Lionel Hutz, his second appearance after after Bart gets hit by a car. They're like, oh, this character's <laughs> coming back a million times. I forgot he's in this because he's in it once. Mm-hmm, they, but it's great to see him. And and, and he's used in a way they would use him uh, from then on where they're like we have hit a scene where we either have to make up a lawyer or reuse somebody and they're like well we've got lionel hutz now no he is every lawyer we need unless it's a good lawyer then it's blue haired lawyer and unlike with uh, Aunt gladys he doesn't try to steal the inheritance money yeah he's not as dirty as he is yet <laughs> you'd be you surprised know? how often that works right yeah you really would <laughs> uh, but but let's let's hear good old phil hartman once again it was a beautiful service wasn't it mr Simpson? Ah! Who the hell are you? Lionel Hutz, attorney at law. I'm the executor of Beatrice Simmons' estate. Mr. Simpson B was a wealthy woman, and surprise, surprise, she left everything to you. Really? There is one catch. You must spend one night in a haunted house. (laughs) Just kidding. Just kidding. Here's a check for $106,000 to enjoy as you see fit. Oh, I'm touched. $106,000? Ta-ta, Mr. Simpson. By the way, old-timer, I do wills. Why don't I just give you this pen with my phone number on it? It looks just like a cigar. (laughs) Isn't that something? (laughs) <laughs> you know, hearing these clips, I totally forgot that uh, you can hear deep, deep in the mix, people are coughing in the background. Yeah. 
Like, yeah, for a few uh, first couple clips of this, I was like, is this us? What the? No, but it's just the ambient noise of the retirement castle. <laughs> no, I mean, I love Lionel Hutz. He's, he's so funny, even though he's like not half as skeezy as he'd be. I just, I do assume now, knowing the character, that it was really like $200,000 <laughs> yeah. and he kept 94000 of it. This but. is one of his many uh, uh, pieces of like Lionel Hutz memorabilia that he has. He mm. has the cigar pen. He's got the cigarette smoking monkey. He's got the uh, the business card that turns into a sponge. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, I, I I slow down there, Smokey. That's my my favorite of them. But uh, also, apparently, they cut a joke in here, which I'm really glad they did. They said they had a fallen and I can't get up joke in there, which they recognized by early 1991, like as played out as it could be. Like we got to stop this, you know. I I remember I I mean, look as a, as a mean little child, we all laughed at this funny what a funny scene of a woman who is struggling to get up and need help we, we would we, yeah we'd fall down in the playground and yeah. do the line yeah oh sorry libby are you do you <laughs> you know this reference uh it i know the reference now i wouldn't have when i was a kid but uh, i do know it now i've been here long enough to mm. have, have heard about it it was for life call uh, yes yeah <laughs> yeah just the yeah uh, it the, there was just something the way that lady said i like her bad acting of saying the line i've fallen and i can't get up it made us all laugh in in the in the late 80s so fresh to me i'm sure i find it very funny <laughs> i'm finding out some shocking facts about this whole oh. uh this actor in this commercial uh the lady who performed the line an actual old lady the person who took the fall was a stunt person mm. so they didn't push an old lady down for that commercial that's good i'm glad i'm glad <laughs> and she passed away in 1997 so she lived mm. through the many jokes about her that's yeah. great to know that's great yeah <laughs> uh and uh, so yeah they they also they've done many jokes since on the simpsons about having to stay in a haunted house they they're really into jokes like that i like the specificity of one hundred six thousand dollars. like it's not it's not grandpa becomes a millionaire and it's not like a crazy amount of money that would change everything but it's enough money that you go like well i want that money like i i but but not like the, the, the everyone's lives are different you know yeah that would pay for a about one year at a nursing home mm-hmm. these days in like a more expensive state so it's it, like in in today's money it is kind of funny it's like okay i mean it's probably like you know enough to pay off some of his debts yes. maybe you know it's like really not a huge amount of, of money it certainly isn't like wow what am i going to do with all this money money you know well and i mean abe though could use it because as we find out like uh later the way the reason the simpsons own a house is because abe sold his old house to buy their house so he he kind of doesn't have a savings left anymore i think he's he's counting on that tontine to really pay off <laughs> i think but i do love the cruelty the one one of the few times abe acts like abe in this is him cruelly calling homer to say like oh i actually am speaking to you now to tell you you will never get my money fuck you like, <laughs> just homer homer's dough on the end of it is good but then then we get like i understand why this the owner of the retirement castle never came back because he's just a creep like yeah, yeah he's uh i don't know implying that sexual favors can take place i guess so yeah that yeah. was weird <laughs> there are rub downs yeah it's, yeah this crooked administrator this could be his last appearance at least as a character right uh, according well i double checked it on the wiki that uh, he never appears for a spoken line after this mm. he's one of those guys like occasionally you see him in the background but but nothing else i mean he does have a good line of him saying like yes but it passes like <laughs> that that's good just him admitting like yeah occasionally i do feel bad that i'm evil but it goes away and i uh, <laughs> that's more realistic than somebody being angry all the time or evil all the time i, I, I think a lot of this uh, nursing home stuff comes from macaroni because he worked at an old folks home mm. as a teenager uh, washing the trays and just like washing the mush that they ate <laughs> off of the trays <laughs> cleaning the mush off the trays of these people who were born in like 1870 <laughs> so then abe decides he's gonna live it up he does the first thing to he's gonna buy that napoleon hat the not the real hat i do as a scam by herman that's pretty great that he he's selling something as napoleon's hat which is like napoleon would never have worn a fez never been drawn a painted wearing a fez and he just has the audacity to say that's napoleon's hat (laughs) and then once he sells it he takes grandpa's old hat and says it's the one mckinley was shot in uh which in artist renderings of his assassination he is hatless i repeat hatless (laughs) so uh that's uh, another inaccuracy there but 
uh, yeah, that Herman Herman got away with it. He's he's probably I would think Herman once he found out that Abe was rich, he's like, well, that hundred thousand dollars, I'm getting most of that. He's gonna buy everything at this store. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's uh, marking up the prices of all of his surface to air missiles at that moment. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh God, the nuke, the nuke, the the hippie killer nuke he's got in the back. He was sure he was gonna sell it at this point today. <laughs> <laughs> so then Abe sets off on a, a series of fun things. He's being driven by the same limo driver as in the way we was and aged up appropriately mm-hmm. yeah this this was before they decided that anybody could have the bronson voice and uh when silverman heard the recording of the guy had the, the bronson voice he's like oh then it it's the guy who drove homer around 16 years earlier so i gotta age him up to that age or that he could exist without any uh, throughout any point in time like yes, he could be the yeah. same guy <laughs> in the 60s and the 70s bronson voice man unstuck in time <laughs> that's what he is abe heads around he goes to mud wrestling the uh, the same mud wrestling place where homer was searching for princess cashmere uh, in, in season one i just got the joke actually uh, behind that instead of club med yeah it's club uh, mud uh, listen they're not all winners uh, i didn't i and i like i like dan's bemusement of eh, it's, it's cute. yeah that is good that's that's one of the the few like really good laughs that i that i got out of this is the way he repeats that over and over well that and that abe is a even with a bunch of money abe will be miserable no matter where he goes anyway because he's he's a grumpy old man and uh their first of many disney jokes they go to d-i-z-n-e-e land uh which has a big sign up that says completely unrelated to disneyland or disney world uh but the last laugh was on them Mm because disney owns them now like (laughs) all their disney jokes they they didn't know that they'd eventually get owned by the mouse like all things do soon to be scrubbed from the disney plus version i'm sure (laughs) i'm waiting for jokes to disappear honestly because they have cut things out of other content and i'm surprised some things have stuck behind on the simpsons except for the michael jackson episode that's the one Mm. you know what maybe they do recognize that like they could get a a little press coverage happens when they like you know add some underpants to splash for instance but a cut to a simpsons thing will get a lot more like digital footprint that i uh, they probably like ah forget it just keep in the nazi supermen or our superiors line (laughs) because otherwise it'll just make people see it even more Mm -hmm. uh though you know in oh brother where art thou episode abe had a heart or a mild heart uh issue i feel like it's very risky for him to be riding a a big roller coaster like that i should be doing it yeah he's he's inviting death he's trying to join b he's that's you know i think you're right that's really what it's that's why he went parasailing before this Uh, but this is when he's visited by B and in moments like this I also feel bad I think about this with so many old actors who have to be in things where they die I feel bad for those old actors having to play like oh talk about being dead or how you just died or how you're going to die at least it's better than being in a live action role in which you will be in your deathbed acting yeah for multiple yeah, days you know true. That, that feels like it'd be more depressing yeah i feel like that was most of the scenes of burgess meredith like mm. most of his last roles in movies were about being like very old and laying down or like the in this i'm watching the second season of sopranos now and like the majority of scenes for the the actress playing tony's mom are like <laughs> laying in bed or sitting in a chair well yeah. on the great sitcom strangers with candy when jerry blank's dad died they had to get a different actor to lay in the coffin because the original guy did not want to lay <laughs> in a coffin being a very old man himself can you believe can you believe that he was right to do that yeah he was right to not want to do that but i mean yes a ghost visits abe i miss b i miss you too Ah! oh abraham calm down i'm not here to scare you they've got me haunting a family in texas oh well, I'm glad you're keeping busy. Now listen, Abe. I want to know why my money isn't bringing you happiness. Oh, B, I'm not cut out for the high life. Abraham, if you're not happy with the money, why don't you spread it around? Make other people as happy as you made me. Oh, thanks, B. I will. And go see your son. He misses you. Oh, I miss him too, the big fat dickhead. <laughs> hey, B, I'm gonna ask you. What was death like? Not as scary as this! (laughs) 
it's a fairly it's a fairly dreary episode but i did like the joke uh we get a wide shot of the uh, roller coaster going up the hill slowly that is when grandpa is screaming yeah he's screaming at the wrong part <laughs> that's fine i did laugh Not at that bad. yeah why did no one want to sit next to grandpa on this roller coaster i mean because he mm. smells i guess is that why <laughs> no, that's why there's an empty seat there <laughs> if you're a single rider can't you say like i don't want to sit next to anybody yeah they usually shut well now in in uh s- s- covid times i think they'd uh, you'd get more empty seats next to you but i I've I've been on Disney rides with like no shove another person in there can't have an empty seat let's get this line moving well maybe he bribed the attendant with his bee bucks mm, ooh that's true bee bucks. yeah it's the uh, bee <laughs> it's uh, it's cute too the uh, the Silverman uh, uh, kind of admonishes them on the commentary for cutting a line he liked which is when he says I'm not cut out for the high life his next line was if I live it up anymore I'll be dead oh no offense which. That's funny. I, I yeah, don't want to cut that. The, the the high life thing is funny because it's like his idea of the high life is like going to an amusement park. <laughs> it's like yeah. really not that high. You know, it's not like he's like doing coke or anything. Mm, or you're know, like, oh, seeing the Eiffel Tower. Like, oh, I always wanted to go to France. Like something like, no, he, he just went to what seemingly is a local amusement it's a park. Very limited imagination on Abe. <laughs> Her comforting him is at least like his turning point in the episode when he, he uh, Abe makes a decision about what he's going to do with it. Uh, and that he's gonna forgive Homer so it's it's good for wrapping up the scene Homer like crying about missing his father it's it, it Dan's playing it just too real it's just a sad person who misses their is his dad like and who's yeah. who's like crying like a little boy it's it's sad it's it's only sad it's not really funny uh, yeah and it's just completely incongruous with with future Homer and, and future Abe you know the idea of just the idea of Homer referring to Abe as his daddy is just like completely mm. not in character at all. Yeah, even earlier, Marge calls him dad, which yeah. just sounded off to me. She usually calls him grandpa. Yeah, it's much better she calls him grandpa. It's it's like, it feels too old school that like to mm. have the wife call the father-in-law dad. Like that, that feels like a thing from the 50s. That's, that's Marge becoming a 50s mom, you know, mm. which occasionally she turns into the mom of the uh, baby boomer writers of the show. But other times she's, she's written more more as an uh, a normal person <laughs> we then get a little filler time of calling a marvin monroe self-help line of just listing things people have anxiety for there's a fun impotence joke uh snuck in here oh what was at it? the end uh it's going down like press one for this press two for this if you have problems maintaining an error and then homer oh, hangs up oh that's good henry you're not listening for the boner jokes there's I one in every episode <laughs> i mean until having it uh isolated here i missed that the guy calls them uh buana when they go to the play like that's why he said like oh good luck buana like what is buana it I, I he wasn't saying partner but on frankie it says partner i i think that's like a swahili or zulu it's like okay. it's, if you were watching a movie about a colonialist expeditions like the the african friend uh in there would call somebody buana it's like tarzan would say that word it means a boss or master so uh, uh sometimes frankie will get the uh dialogue incorrect well, there you go yeah but i feel like that's from old tarzan movies where you know a native person in uh in one of those would would call tarzan buana but now that i know it's master that makes it uh, even worse those scenes anyway so but Abe, Abe arrives and uh, a father and son reunion happens. Oh, my precious sack of gold. Uh, Couldn't <laughs> buy me the pleasures of a simple family meal. Pass the bug juice, Dad. Wait your turn, you pig. I have an announcement to make. I've decided to give bees money away. There are people who really need it. I'm going to let them come to me and plead their case, and then I'll decide who needs it most. Grandpa, that's the noblest thought that's ever been expressed at this table. Give it us, Grandpa. Bart! Forgive him, Dad. He's just a stupid little kid who says the first thing that pops into his head. But you know, there's wisdom in his innocence. You don't want it. Yes, I do. Too bad you ain't getting it. (laughs) Uh, that gave me a chuckle. I looking at this realistically, Homer would have a grudge against Abe from then on that he didn't give him a hundred thousand dollars and instead invested it in a retirement castle instead. Like he's like, hey, you just spent my inheritance, Dad. Like I, I could see Homer actually uh, carrying a grudge about that if he's if he's a realistic person and not you know a crazy cartoon character. <laughs> 
Uh, I also like that Abe is trying to give a speech about, you know, money can't buy you a simple things, but it's just being belched through. His corn is just <laughs> flinging onto him. And it's cute that Homer says, pass the bug juice, meaning fruit punch, I guess. That's mm. that's what you would uh, at a summer camp, you would call fruit punch bug juice. So Some kind of cheap, uh, like, mixed drink, yeah, Kool-Aid drink. Yeah. That's uh, I again. That's one of those ones of like, oh, it's commentary or uh, put the subtitles on. Oh, he says bug juice there. That's it's an extra cuteness of Homer asking for that instead of like pass the drink or pass the potatoes. He says bug juice and uh, and yeah, I mean Bar- Bart is correct in a, like he should want that money. That's why he, that's why he, Bart gets in the line to beg for it as well <laughs> too. And it also feels very season two that they just fade out. They're like you know what, fa- just the scene ends fade out. Like well we'll uh, go to commercial. It wasn't that. the strongest uh, act break joke, mm-hmm. but I guess it was funny. And then we come back from the act break with more continuity and, and proof of them writing this right after the Thanksgiving one. Uh, as noted by you, Bob, in the in the story of, of Kent Brockman's uh, relationships in the Thanksgiving episode, it is rumored that Kent Brockman is dating the weather lady. And when Kent Brockman introduces this thing, he says is the most talked about thing since I married the Stephanie, the weather lady. So it's uh, it's accurate. You know, it's it is correct continuity for his relationships. I believe not seen until the episode tennis the menace yes yeah she she was cut out of the valentine's day apu episode but she would be first seen in tennis the menace which uh we actually did a podcast about like about two three months ago yeah so, so you won't see his wife until uh, a decade later unfortunately and uh, the line of people waiting in weird costumes as uh, jay kogan explained to us when we interviewed him that is a reference to how in summer of 1989 when writing the first season all the writers went to see the batman movie that was brand new and they said it you know seeing it at its big opening night in la there were people dressed up both as like the joker and as darth vader and indiana jones <laughs> in the line for some reason it was yeah, f- i wondered if it was some sort of early comic-con thing but it was their first experience with cosplay i think yeah yeah now now if you see somebody dressed as joker in your theater run the other way that's (laughs) this get get out of there or anywhere really yes yeah uh you know it was different to be jokerified back then was to want the fancier things in life and to be cool like jack nicholson that was being (laughs) jokerified one weird thing i noticed was like quimby's outfit is different than it it would be later he's wearing like a kind of waistcoat and a jacket and he look he looks kind of like the penguin or something yes yeah you know i think it was they pulled out the quimby that appeared in bark gets an f when Mm. he's he's in his winter costume saying it's snow day so he's in his winter he's in his uh dressed for cold in this line he's missing his sash yeah so we don't know he's the mayor he's just some guy (laughs) yeah and i guess yeah brockman is walking by a ton of uh characters we we met before including some guest characters that Mm. are not voiced obviously because they're not talking i like seeing crusty in a sweater that made me like why why? he's like oh it's a little chilly out he's in his formal gear to beg Uh, for money and it's funny that Brockman just joins the line like everybody else. So yeah, talk about time killers. This is just now a sketch of characters come up and pitch why they'd want money to him. So it's just it's a series of of sketches. I like this part the most. Yeah. It's oh, a bunch of rapid fire yeah. jokes and like Dan is clearly in the same room with these actors and they're mm-hmm, playing off mm-hmm. of each other in a very fun way. Uh, we, we first see Otto's uh, pitch to uh, make his bus really awesome. Uh, he drew a version of it. This is back when Otto was an artist because in in three men in a comic book he'll also be pitching his own comic strip series uh, and so the artist rendition though is meant to look like big daddy roth the creator of rat fink mm-hmm. uh who also his art style was seen on the cover of cartoons the magazine homer gets a real magazine that yes. we did research about <laughs> uh you don't see the cobra wrapped around the naked chick yeah, in his uh drawing what the hell? i want to but no. still the level of detail they got in there i feel bad for the uh artist in south korea at acom being told like could you draw a hyper de- uh, detailed version of this piece of art <laughs> It was funny as well because I was thinking about how the scene is, is a little bit like in uh, Who Shot Mr. Burns when everyone's coming to Skinner to, to ask for oil money and yeah. Otto shows up there too asking for a double guitar. Mm. So he's, he's clearly he's clearly a good one to go to here for like stupid shit to ask for. They, right. they really loved Otto at this point. Otto comes back for the bus ride in a few minutes too mm-hmm. for more yeah. jokes. 
They yes, thought, yeah. By season three, they do an episode they think is a stealth pilot for an auto spinoff. Like that's the they. It's called the Auto Show. It's the one with uh, Spinal Tap in it, and they really thought like, oh, Auto is our breakout guy, man. He'll be the star of his own show. Uh, you know, I prefer his double guitars thing. That's that's more. You know, he's thinking smaller in that. <laughs> it's it's more achievable. Uh, but yes, then we had a very funny scene of Burns begging Grandpa for money, which I I really love here. Grandpa. I can call you Grandpa, can't I? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. All right. I need that money. Please, please! Wait wait a minute, wait. You're the guy who owns the nuclear power plant. Well, the ownership is divided. What the hell do you think you're doing? (laughs) Mr. Simpson, I dread the day when $100,000 isn't worth groveling for. Get out of here! You've just made yourself a very powerful enemy, old man. (laughs) Here's the deal, Grandpa. A guy I think was an explorer left this in the bar one night. It may be a map to ancient treasure or directions to some guy's house, but to find out, we'll need money, we'll need provisions, and a two-man diving bell. It's pretty stupid, but so far you're the front runner. Mm. <laughs> I love that look on Mo, the drawing mm. of Mo, and he goes, mm, like, that's, that's a really funny drawing. That, but that also is a bad sign for this episode, that when Mo makes that pitch, I'm like, I want to watch that episode. I want to see Mo and Abe on an event, on a treasure hunt. Can we go there? Yeah. yeah. Better act three. <laughs> but yeah, Burns begging for money and saying that he'd, you know, it's he he doesn't care. $100,000 would seemingly be nothing to him, but he'd beg for it because it's, it's worth it. He must have that money. Uh, it's a, right, and that's... That's totally in character for Burns as well. Like, because it's a huge part of the Burns character is just like the greed to to the the point of the final dollar is is that one is more in character I would say than other characters in this episode. Yeah, actually, I guess in Who Shot Mr. Burns, he also begs for money in the same in the same way. Though he's the last one mm. in the scene instead of the first. I also it's always funny to remember Burns <laughs> saying to him like, "Oh, I, I can call you Grandpa." They are in a tontine and served in World War II together. They know each other very well. <laughs> Burns is old than him burns is older than him that too yes yeah but the name is just like uh oh, don't you run the nuclear power plant and i also like that the the board that runs it that doesn't exist anymore after this episode too but it's a very funny thing to hear burns say <laughs> uh then we get a, a cute little scene with marvin monroe basically describing the skinner box uh which what that's a real dark jug that he's yeah. like oh that's a beauty part it's already built i need to buy a child <laughs> Yeah, I need money to buy a baby is a really good line. To prove that torturing someone will make them resent him. Yeah, I love that too. He's like, oh, I want, well, I want to see they'll make him harbor a deep resentment for me. Like, it's it's good. It's good. Uh, and uh, then Bart, meanwhile, sits on his knee and treats him like he's Santa Claus, listing all the things. Uh, he must have been watching Ninja Turtles because he asked for nunchucks. And uh, he asked for Radioactive Man number 27, uh, the first time he fought Dr. Crab, which uh, we've interviewed him before, Bill Morrison the artist for a bunch of classic simpsons comics he actually really cares a lot about the radioactive man continuity and he made sure when he was doing the radioactive man comics in 94 dr crab was his lex Luthor and mm. used him quite a lot they actually really respected the importance of dr crab i think he's in that awful video game that they yes made. yeah he's uh he's one of the top villains they face though in uh uh and i also think with this one-off joke here that's why they decided they'd write an episode where bart wants to get radioactive man number one mm. i think like, oh yeah bart wants a radioactive man comic. That. that's an episode and the baseball card with the guy flipping the bird is the uh billy martin 1972 detroit tigers card mm-hmm. now there are a few cards like this my favorite is the one that has the word fuck face written on the baseball bat fuck face is a classic yeah. one yes yeah i billy martin was famous famous as a drunk asshole that's his funny mm. story i i only know facts about uh, baseball players in relation to wrestling and billy martin was present at the first wrestlemania so uh, i've heard <laughs> i've heard funny stories about him being a drunk jerk i have to assume because al Jean is from detroit maybe oh. this card was being passed around in his youth totally totally and yeah, that you're i absolutely i i looked up with the other middle finger baseball card ones apparently in the 90s baseball player frank thomas had multiple pictures of him <laughs> baseball cards of him with one finger up uh, now frank thomas i just know him as uh, one of the many nugenic sellers on television if if you watch broadcast tv at any time you will see frank thomas going like hey your wife will thank you too if you get these pills they really help you out if you know what i mean <laughs> you'll never strike out again frank thomas says so now 
after that scene we get quite a first for the show one of uh, a surprisingly endearing character in the history of the simpsons the prof- the professor who makes you laugh and makes you think <laughs> what the hell is that why it's a death ray my good man behold hey feels warm kind of nice well it is just the prototype. With proper funding, I'm confident this little baby could destroy an area the size of New York City. But I want to help people, not kill them. Oh. Well, to be honest, the ray only has evil applications. You know, my wife will be happy. She's hated this whole <laughs> death ray thing from day one. I like the idea that he has a wife. It comes up again next year, I think. My wife is going to kill me. Yes, when he when his son in a uh, <laughs> in an airplane flies out the window. I like to think she left him after that, and that's why there's no wife mm-hmm. mentioned afterwards for Frank. Yeah, and this is John Frank, uh, named after who would uh, future future Simpsons writer John Frank. Uh, fr- apparently, a friend of Jake Hogan. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was not a TV writer at this time, so probably they went to school together. Or they were in LA together, or perhaps Groundlings together. Who knows? But yes, John. Frank would become a writer for the show uh, in the t- in the tens and the th- yeah 11s? In, the, in the in the Scully years. Yeah. Uh, him and Don Payne were a writing team. The the late Don Payne. That's right. So yeah, it's funny that for Frank, who was it was just Frank on the page, like he's you know we uh, Bart the Daredevil has a proto Frank in it, which was also written by Kogan and Walidarski. So it's funny now that this has full Professor Frank, though without his buck teeth, because Mm -hmm. I think it was they wrote a silly character, they designed him, then they heard it was a Jerry Lewis impersonation by Azaria, and that's when they decided, well, then he's got to have the buck teeth if we're going to, and let's just go all the way with the nutty professor. And of course, Jerry Lewis in Treehouse uh, of Horror 15 would play the Mm -hmm. father of Professor Frank. As just a scene of a wacky scientist trying to sell a death ray, and just realizing like, oh, it's actually pretty evil. You know, my wife, <laughs> like that's great. I love that. Mm. It's so great how he's never considered it. Like he's never considered that it might be like too evil to <laughs> <laughs> to make a death ray that can destroy New York City. The version he has now uh, seems marketable. It's a ray that heats up old people. Yeah, and they're always cold. <laughs> it feels kind of nice. Yeah, it's it's a pleasing ray. Yeah, you should stick with it. But yeah, that he's that he's. Dead Death Ray doesn't just want to like shoot a laser at someone to kill one person. Like he wants it to destroy New York City. Like he's <laughs> thinking that big. Uh, right. And it's so funny the idea that that this little gun can go from something that is kind of warm to like something that is the power of a nuclear bomb. Like it's just it's so absurd. It's, uh, it's very good. Uh, and just how sheepishly he's like drubbing his finger and like oh. Well, it really only has evil purposes. <laughs> he never like, considered it until yeah. now. Then we get Lisa giving him the noble truth of what he should do, which it's like, I guess that that also makes this whole thing just feel like a pointless sketch of like Lisa could have given the speech to him at the dinner table to direct him to it. But uh, they realize like we could get like two or three minutes out of just people walking up to grandpa asking for money. <laughs> but in Lisa's speech, she also looks very weird. She looks she has a giant head. It's supposed to be a perspective shot, but like, she looking down at her yeah yeah but it's a little off but uh when lisa then says or you can get me a pony and she says i'd name it princess and ride it every day in lisa's pony in season three she gets the pony that she calls princess and does ride it every day mm-hmm. so somebody was making a note there too of like <laughs> oh wait, that's that's an episode a, a pony named princess even it would have saved homer a lot of trouble if he just bought lisa the pony he wouldn't have had to get the second job or any of that stuff yeah, Abe should have. I uh, really, I think Abe in future episodes, if he, if he was the Abe of this episode and he saw the many money troubles that Marge and Homer would have afterwards, he'd say, "Wow, I really wish I hadn't uh, put like you know hundreds of thousands of dollars into a <laughs> retirement castle instead of like helping my family with that it." Immediately went back to normal. Yeah, yeah, it, <laughs> right. It becomes dilapidated immediately. <laughs> we then get you know a bunch of uh, depressing shots of just people who are in need and how how horrible the world is like that's depressing and then abe wanders into nighthawks yeah because uh, they're just having fun right <laughs> yes well also you know gene and reese i wonder if they pitch that pubic library sign because they do the same joke in the critic where uh, when the critic is using his hey yeah wait a minute Jay Sherman gets a bunch of money that he decides he's going to use to spend to clean up New York City. Mm. Like, he got... That's the same kind of plot. (laughs) Anyway, in that one, he cleans up the New York Public Library and blasts the letter L off of it so it reads pubic library. That that, Same joke there. (laughs) People run in and they're disappointed. There's more to the joke. (laughs) 
So yes, and then Abe heads uh, home. He's sad. People have no sympathy for him because he's rich, which is the right way to treat a rich person. I think <laughs> uh, you don't want to. You should. You should say to every rich person who says like, "Oh, I'm sad." It's like, ah, uh, too bit, uh, tired from lifting your wallet. That's what you should say. <laughs> Uh, but they decide they're going to head to a casino, realize he could double or even triple his money. Uh, they they head out on the bus. We get several scenes of Otto like scre- uh, singing songs. I couldn't identify the first one, but the second one is Aqualung. It's, oh, it's, first one is Edgar, Edgar Winter's Frankenstein. Oh, okay. All right. Mm, the Aqu- but uh, but yes, let's let's hear a little of this ride to the casino. Slow down! Are you trying to get us killed? It's too hot, you maniac! Turn on the air already! Hey, mellow out, old dudes, or I'll jam this baby into a river! All right? All right. <laughs> Miss, I'm looking for Abe Simpson. Mm-hmm. It's important I get a hold of him. I have to tell him I don't care about his money and I love him. We get that a lot. <laughs> he left this morning with a senior casino junket. Casino? Ah! <laughs> Come on, everybody! I guess it's funny that the old people are joining in with the the, the mumbling of Aqua Lung. Yeah, that's fun. That's fun. <laughs> now, you're, you, man, that was so. I, I'm disappointed in myself for not recognizing Frankenstein there. Yeah, I, uh, that's a good line too. Of like, I I don't care about his money and I love him. We get that a lot. Like that's <laughs> that's a good line. I also love uh, Otto's just delivery of like, all right, man. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I do love the idea as well that he would just commit suicide by driving into a river just to, uh, you know, piss off some old people. He's like, I can't take this anymore. I'll kill us all right now if you don't shut up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> also, you note the voice of old Jewish man, but it's a different character design saying it. Though. Like, oh, slow okay. down, you. Like that's that's the old Jewish man. The the design wouldn't exist until. Uh, hey, I'm your grandpa, Sonny. Hey, look, hey, that, you know, the, that from. Uh, <laughs> Bart, uh, that's from New Kid on the Block. Okay. That's the one. So the can your grandfather do this guy? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Who would eventually become old Jewish man. Also, the receptionist previously had been voiced by Julie Kavner, but I think by this point they decided, like, it's just to, if Julie voices any character other than a Bouvier, it is distracting. Mm-hmm. It really is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, so yes we head over to uh plato's pleasure palace which i think it's a great joke of like a casino completely misunderstanding a historical figure and why why they're memorable <laughs> like plato uh the uh, you know famous philosopher would not own a casino and tell people about how great pleasure is and gambling is didn't notice it until silverman points it out on the commentary Me too. yeah which is uh when plato says my philosophy is enjoy and he lifts his arm up <laughs> behind him are many young boys mm-hmm. attending to him which uh, <laughs> i yes. don't know why i didn't get that until now it's a very sly joke about uh let's say pedophilia in ancient greece yes yeah <laughs> not a, the, hey those are platonic boys he's mm. just he's just teaching them bob and that's all i want to think about obviously a parody of caesar's palace yes uh, and yes. plato's republic is something he uh, a dialogue a famous dialogue the republic it's it's cute that's funny it's like, clever clever writing yeah I'm a smart guy yeah i uh you know i've i've been to caesar's a couple times it's fine though my 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 home casino is mgm which is just like its thing is i guess old hollywood though not even like you'll see a big lion there but that's really it at the at the mgm casino now excalibur that's fun that's it's old timey it's basically mm. like medieval times except uh, except it has like a dick's wings in it <laughs> except guys with thin blue line t-shirts are walking around oh yeah punisher shirts oh, no. abound <laughs> all uh, all over in vegas look that's why you that's why you, if you drink enough frozen daiquiris you don't notice them and you just have a good time <laughs> and the uh, the whole concept of the 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 senior bus trip to the casino is another really depressing thing that uh, i feel like they don't linger on it too much like the, the sort of depressing angle of it but it really is very sad mm-hmm. it's it's to take people to a place where they can all lose their pensions mm-hmm. like yeah it's, <laughs> you know what when i worked at a grocery store nobody played the lottery more than old people mm-hmm. and they would come in every day to play the lottery <laughs> uh, you know you got to do something with that free time mm-hmm. plus they they they're from that generation they actually had like an inherited or they had like you know a nest egg to to gamble away uh there's there's another really i did laugh pretty good at homer uh screeching to a halt and then revealing he was just going to the crusty burger the first like appearance that. of crusty burger oh wow in the entire show I didn't note that that's pretty yes. great oh that's awesome that is like uh you know it felt novel at the time to hear a joke about a bad uh drive-through thing 
that, I, I, I'll always laugh at that sound. I have to commend him as well on his order. He orders a double cheeseburger, onion rings, and a strawberry shake, which is a really good fast food order. So he knows what he's doing. Now, now uh, Homer would order like five meals. Yeah. That. Just having to limit yeah. himself to one double cheeseburger. It's, uh, That's not extreme enough. I didn't even get fries. Didn't even get a drink, you know. I, sh- uh, you know, I showed Bob beforehand the a uh domino's sponsors the simpsons on sky one commercial and the ad for domino's was and we have onion rings now which i was like i it seems crazy to eat onion rings with a pizza that's that's Mm. it's too much grease too too greasy i promise you that is not the most disgusting thing that you would get at a british domino's (laughs) (laughs) is is british domino's just america food is that it's not just like pizza Kind of, yeah. I mean, I remember we used to get it a lot when I was at uni because there was one near campus. And I remember when I went back to England a couple of years later um, and I was like, I was like, oh, maybe I'll get Domino's for old time's sake. And, you know, I remember really enjoying it when I was at uni. And then after a few years in America, I had Domino's and I was like, this is disgusting. Like, I can't <laughs> believe I used to think this was really good food. So I don't know whether it's that British Domino's is worse than American Domino's or that British food is just generally worse or that I just got older and, you know, like the nostalgia factor was gone, but it was Mm. really grim. It comes with this like garlic and herb sauce, which I guess is meant to be like British ranch, but it's it's very mm. semeny. It's really nice. <laughs> that's a good descriptor. Um, yeah, like the Domino's in Canada are actually pretty good, but whenever you order from them, uh, they recommend. Would you like a tray of brownies with this? How about cinnamon rolls? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm buying a pie. Yes, yeah. <laughs> already. Uh, yeah, it's I, a pie. For many of those places, if you get like garlic knots or breadsticks, it's like this is just more pizza. Like this is just a different form of pizza that i'm getting now i we know domino's in america low on the totem pole of order out pizza to me like i Mm -hmm. as a kid we were a pizza hut family that was quite right too yeah yeah. it's uh i have one of those in my in my hometown in britain we had it we had a pizza hut and it was just like we had a sit down restaurant pizza uh, hut which was amazing and it had like the i don't know if they the american one has the ice cream factory where mm, you like hmm. go and like do soft serve yourself and then you put little you know m&ms and like you know gummy bears and stuff on top of it but that was incredible uh, yeah i considered sit down pizza hut fancy when i was a kid oh yeah it's like oh if it's my birthday i could ask to go to a (laughs) sit down pizza hut yeah the pepsi (laughs) comes in a pitcher oh pitcher a Pepsi mm. fan. Yeah. Uh, so going to the end here, they run off to the Homer finally arrives at the casino. He needs to stop Abe from gambling. I really love the shots of Homer like running through the casino and just his screaming. Like Silverman did artistically that this is an exciting segment here. Yeah, especially the scream where it cuts between three different angles very rapidly and oh. some very crazy expressions on Homer that are very just David Silverman drawings. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I also like Homer saying like he, he looks like me, but he's wrinkled. Like that's that's a great line. Uh, but Abe is playing uh, playing the roulette wheel, which is a favorite of mine. I do like that roulette wheel. It I like that you know if you play blackjack, it's just so fast. So like A and bloop twenty one done. And the waiting for the wheel, like the waiting to pick your number and then the waiting for it to finish bouncing around. That's the fun part to mm. me. You get you, the the moment of tension for that. Uh, but yes, he meets up with Abe and Abe has quite a speech, uh, which is incredibly un grandpa like here i want to point out one thing first so abe does place a winning bet he places a five thousand dollar bet on one number and he gets it miraculously the payout for that is 35 to 1 abe got one hundred seventy five thousand dollars on that one bet wow wow so homer was right he should have walked away Sorry, absolutely Libby. no i'm just like wow that's a lot of money <laughs> he's uh yeah i guess you know when he walks away from the table with all of his chips i guess he's got like five hundred thousand or something <laughs> because a hundred thousand wasn't enough to fix up the retirement home but then maybe that what maybe 500 or uh he he definitely does pretty well here but yes uh he gives a, a, a homer tries to convince him and he gives a speech back to him uh during the speech you will see david silverman west archer and Ro- uh rich moore all drawn into the sequence yeah rich moore just comes into the foreground <laughs> yes in that scene with all the uh, directors Beat it, boy! You're cramping my style. Dad, please, you gotta quit by your head. You understand that? You gotta take all your money and leave now. Sorry, boy, I have to get enough to help everybody. But you could lose everything. Come on. Homer, I think Rudyard Kipling said it best. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose, 
and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And, which is more, you'll be a man, my son. You'll be a bonehead, come on. Put it on, 41. I've got a feeling about that number. The wheel only goes to 36, sir. Okay, put it all on 36. I've got a feeling about that number. Dad, no! <laughs> Give me that! Give me that funny! Oh, Come on! Ow! Ow! You're You're 36. 36. 36! Good good screaming there. I like I, I do like Homer cutting him off with like, you'll be a bonehead. <laughs> like, yes. But the, yeah, this is not uh, Abe Simpson. No, him knowing a very different. A very different character from the guy who says he did the Iggy. Yes. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> that guy would not know uh, all these lines from uh, uh, Kipling's If uh, poem, which right. they note on the commentary that in the script, they had way more lines from the poem, which really does just feel like filler on their part. <laughs> uh, if, if you look up the, the poem yourself, uh, the line Grandpa says, he then skips like about 19 lines of the poem to get to the coda about being a man. So I do remember watching it. As a, as a little girl and <laughs> the ending of it being and you'll be a man and I was kind of like why would I don't want to be a man like <laughs> shut up <laughs> uh, you didn't you know Kipling he wasn't thinking about uh, if, no. if, if Kipling ever thinks about what a little girl thinks I'd, I'd be surprised Kipling was like yeah. women don't read poetry yes, it would have... yes the man was not woke <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I've seen the jungle book I know what goes on in there oh yeah <laughs> uh, but uh, it's fun I also like the drawing of Abe biting Homer like when <laughs> yeah. like Silverman got the lines of Homer saying, Ow, you're hurting me. He's like, Okay, I need to draw Abe biting Homer's <laughs> arm in this shot. But Homer actually saves Abe and prevents him from losing all of his money on one on betting on 36. It ends on zero, which you wouldn't even get if you bet red or black. It's uh, it's the worst number to land on. Uh, Abe, in a very ADR style, says, for the first time in my life, I'm glad I've had children, uh, which he used a plural children, which is correct because he does have uh, Herb as well. But yeah. otherwise, I wonder if they changed that. If he, Do you think he had said, I'm glad I had a son when he should? have pluralized it to children since he mm. has more than one son i think it's just more of a generic expression it's not meant to indicate a number sure okay just like i'm thinking about having children <laughs> and then you have one child and it's okay and uh then you know i asked him on twitter uh david silverman did not reply unfortunately so we'll never know <laughs> why abe's hands look the way they do in this it's next shot because you can't add detail to a character with three fingers without making him look like a ninja turtle mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> they are they as abe reflects on who he would want to help he looks at his old hands and turns them over but we to me as a kid i thought ninja turtle hands 100 mm -hmm. yes yeah yeah like these characters are not designed to add all of this detail to they just look grotesque i mean look at the realistic homer cgi head that pops up or the realistic mo mm -hmm. the more realistic they are the more hideous they are well it's like uh, in the one where uh, the kids <laughs> are imagined as, as humans with the <laughs> with the pink skin and the blonde hair and stuff and it's absolutely horrifying <laughs> well and Abe goes off model more than most in these early seasons too like in uh in the blowfish episode when he says like let's go out fishing like he's everything's wrong with Abe in that shot it's uh mm -hmm. it the amount of lines on Abe mess it all up but yes the, okay now it's time for the very sweet ending I'll play the clip first then we can talk about it but Abe realizes who he really wants to help in this final clip John you saved me from losing all my money. For the first time in my life, I'm glad I had children. So, uh, have you figured out who gets your money? Yes, Homer, I have. Dignity's on me, friends. 
Yeah, on the commentary, one of the writers said, we did not write that. We could not have written that. <laughs> it does feel like they couldn't finish their homework in time and they passed it off to James L. Brooks. Because so they admit this is something James L. Brooks did. That Rudyard Kipling thing is a James L. Brooks thing. Right, And right. Like, I guess whenever Grandpa is acting out of character, it's because James L. Brooks wanted to make it more emotional. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Brooks writes fa- uh, parent and child, an adult child and uh, uh, aging parent things. He wrote so many. I mean, Terms of Endearment won him an Oscar and that that's what that movie's all about so i guess he's probably like oh interplay between homer and his dad that's all me baby mm-hmm. but yeah the, the ending is just with the music and everything it's, it's just too much so sweet it's yeah sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but especially that it's like the beatrice simmons memorial dining hall and i also yeah. thought about at the end here of like so does abe own this place now did he <laughs> buy it like <laughs> does does abe own it from this point onward well and it sucks because like now that slimy retirement home guy gets what he wanted you know like yeah. he gave a bunch of money to the retirement i wonder mm. if he got the rub down Ooh, mm, maybe that's post credit scene yeah <laughs> yeah uh. it's uh i i guess people always say uh season two oh the, the show had so much emotion in this case i feel like it's really unearned you go to a classic episode like lisa substitute i think they earn it absolutely they earn their sweet ending in this one it just kind of it's too much it's not earned and grandpa is not the character who we've kn- even at least known this far he gets way more exaggerated later but this is not the same guy that was in episodes before this yeah who at least was like an old crank asshole you know and also like by the time i see the point you know i see the the beatrice simmons memorial sign on the door i'm like oh right this is all because of b because she's been <laughs> dead for 10 minutes and you've all already kind of forgotten that it's that it's to do with her you know like we've, we've gone so far away from that now it's a whole thing about like abe having money and feeling guilt and homer and all of this other stuff and by that point you're like oh right that's why he has money it's because his girlfriend died and he was sad about that <laughs> Uh, I guess, I mean, at least it lets him close the book on that for her. Like, it's, uh, and uh, this is a reference to a very old film, uh, the 1932 anthology film, If I Had a Million. Uh, The plot of it is that a rich old guy who hates his family wants to give away his money, and uh, he's looking for people to give it to, which leads to just basically a series of short films of like, well, what if he gave a million dollars to this person? Well, that guy would do this or this. And the last one that wraps of the film is an old folks home and an old lady is given a million and at the old folks home the old people are treated you know poorly uh, but Mm. the way they're treated poorly is that they're told like just sit in a rocking chair no excitement for you and then when the old lady buys the uh the place with her million dollars she then hires the staff to make them sit in rocking chairs all day while the old people get to bake pies and play gin rummy and (laughs) and dance again and so you know it sounds like it was made during the depression yeah if i had a million yes yeah (laughs) no a film about like what if you had money like yeah that's the the hit film of 1932 what (laughs) if you had some money but uh but yeah the that that film would inspire the the tv show the millionaire which was just about a rich guy going from place to place and giving people money and it changing their lives the bit about the old folks home especially that's taken straight out of that movie so and uh, it's just on youtube if you want to watch it nobody nobody cares it's not it's not <laughs> it's not on hbo max or, or whoever had the rights to it is not keeping it off so. and the uh, the credits for this episode uh they include who does what voice because obviously uh 1991 no imdb to look at uh maybe like a book about the simpsons could tell you this but people were curious so they let you know but there are some characters on this obviously that would not stick around so hank azaria we see who he plays one of the characters is uh, smitty Huh? We all know Smitty, right? Oh, wait, who the hell? He's the scruffy of the show. Oh, right, yeah. No, no, Smitty <laughs> yeah. is a guy Homer talks to once at work. Oh, right, right, right. But that's it. <laughs> but it does, like, people wanted to know, like, who, like, Dan Castellano is in the show. Who is he? Like, who does he voice? And they mm. tell you in the credits here because people were demanding it. Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, you didn't have the internet then. Maybe you could read, like, you know, a TV guide. They might uh, identify them. But I think, too, you know, it was good. The people should know who does each voice. Like, it's... Uh, it's too bad they don't uh they they could have just stuck with the accrediting of voices they they would uh i think for the same reasoning do that in the simpsons movie in 2007 yeah they did when a name showed up they'd then have a picture of every character in the film that they voiced which including phil rosenthal yeah but (laughs) but uh but uh, the lisa one was funniest to me because it's just uh, you know yardley smith and then it's just just lisa <laughs> just a big <laughs> picture of lisa yeah the yeah i guess the, the final thoughts are the ending just 
it is uh the sweetness of it never bugged me too much in reruns as a kid but this was never my favorite but the the more i watch it the more it feels completely out of character for the simpsons and just too cute and sweet when and not as mean and funny as i'm used to the simpsons being but uh, i think this is the last bits of brooksy sweetness that they must defeat (laughs) to then (laughs) truly become the the classic show it would be just a few episodes later Mm mm-hmm I agree. Yeah, that dignity's on me, friends. Uh, the kids today would call it cringe. And I would have to agree with them. I didn't have a word for it until now. Uh, it just is a, a, an awful period on the sentence, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, there are some fun bits in here. I mean, it's season two. Uh, it's usually pretty good, but it's one of the episodes I don't like to revisit. And there's a few towards the back half of season two I'm not a huge fan of because I think they're all just getting very tired. And and, and of course, revisiting for me also reminds me of how I failed to tape it. So uh, I was like, oh man, I, my greatest defeat. Crazy- shame (laughs) act one was your b simmons who died (laughs) yeah i mean i guess it's kind of good to think of it as like this period where they were figuring out how to be the simpsons you know is is important you know they had to go through this bad period in order to come out on the other side of striking that right balance between you know zany and weird and and dark and also you know very heartwarming but man it sucks to like be <laughs> to be watching one from that period where they had not figured it out uh and where it was just like you know sweetness after sweetness and like characters that don't quite work uh, and everything although i will admit you know i when i was watching the end of this episode i i could hear that you know i was thinking in words like man this is so schlocky this is so like you know sappy or whatever it's stupid and then realized that i was kind of welling up <laughs> it's just so pathetic <laughs> no no that yeah, it, it, even a thing that uh, you think critically, you think, oh, this is, is is corny. Like it can still touch you, even then. Yeah, yeah. it's. Yeah, I it's, mean, I've had that. I've had that same thing watching like you know overproduced viral videos about cats. You know, yes. whatever. <laughs> I'm like pissed off at them for for making me feel. You know, for getting me in the feels and for uh, for making me making me sad. Uh, but I think it, it was the Beatrice Simmons Memorial Hall thing. That was what you know. It was mm. like a direct route to my my crying brain. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> you know. No, it was it wasn't something that I was conscious of. I was just suddenly starting to to feel the tears in the back of the throat, which The Simpsons will still get me. I mean, I've watched like seasons three to nine, you know, a hundred times, and I'll still, you know, if I'm watching, you know, Do It for Her or Homer sitting on the car and looking at the stars after his mum's gone, you know, that can still mm-hmm. that can still get me going. Yeah, I guess it is. Ultimately, it's still scenes of human kindness, but we are critical jerks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we say yeah. we need context. Yeah, I, and justification. Uh, and and hey you know on this journey to the good times they still could discover guys like professor frank you know they're yeah. like hey actually this guy's pretty funny that it, it wasn't all for naught mm-hmm. so libby thanks so much for joining us on this episode please let us know where to find you online and uh what you happen to be working on right now oh thank you so much uh so you know i guess you can follow me on twitter uh, at libby c watson um although i would rather you just go straight to my Substack, which is uh, sicknote.co uh, and that's where i write about healthcare. um maybe one day i'll do some posts about nursing homes i feel like i've got to do that now that we've talked about it <laughs> um but yeah i do uh, a couple times a week a newsletter about healthcare. you know with interviews with people with their experience with our terrible terrible healthcare system uh and always looking for tips as well so tips and, and healthcare stories sick note at substack.com no it's great essential reading you know if you if you care about how awful medical care is in in this country uh it's very informative and even if i've i've learned from uh keeping up with your work that as bad as i think it is it's actually worse Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll try to do. I'll try to find a way to do a funny post uh, at some point. Uh, maybe, maybe by the time this comes out, I'll have found a way to do one funny post about healthcare. So uh, you know, check that out. Because healthcare is so bad in America, I always have a, a trump card to play with my wife, who is Canadian, where she says, "I can't believe you guys get Hulu. We don't get Hulu." And I say, "You get free healthcare. Don't yes. talk to me about yes. Hulu." It's similarly useful for me when I'm getting roasted for British food or our terrible history, you know, imperialism and blah blah blah. I can always just be like well we do have health care mm-hmm. so you know and also americans are not in any position to, to talk when exactly. it comes to roasting britain for anything yeah <laughs> yeah it's like uh you know i'll take our food over yours but i think we both have like yeah the, if it, neither can own the other on like colonialism or slavery or any of that <laughs> stuff no <laughs> no 
<laughs> uh, but but thank you once again, Libby. Yes, thank you, Libby. So thanks again to Libby Watson for being on the show. Please check out all of her stuff. But as for us, if you want to check out more of our stuff and get all these episodes one week at a time and ad free, please go to patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. Sign up there. You'll get just that, but also access to everything behind the $5 paywall. That includes all of our limited miniseries, over 100 bonus episodes you haven't heard if you're not a patron. And our newest miniseries is actually uh, blabbing about Batman, the animated series. We're talking about our 10 favorite episodes of Batman, the animated series, only on Patreon, only behind the five dollar paywall we're talking about that all through the end of 2021 10 new episodes just for you if you're a patron at patreon.com slash talking simpsons and there is a ten dollar level as well when you sign up for that you get all the five dollar stuff of course but also access to one megalon podcast once a month only for patrons of that level or higher and what is that henry bob is talking about the what a cartoon movie podcast so you know uh, we have our sister podcast what a cartoon where twice a month me and bob cover an animated series super in depth just like we do with the simpsons and then at the end of the month we cover an animated feature film mega in-depth as well often over four even over five hours long about films like uh, last month we did batman beyond the return of the joker the month before that we did the road to el dorado and then a disney renaissance summer before that we are now three years deep into doing the what a cartoon movie and the extended five hour long even sometimes podcast about films as uh, diverse as a kira to a goofy movie you can hear the giant back catalog and a new one each month if you go up to that premium ten dollar level at patreon.com slash talking simpsons so please check out all of that stuff today so as for me, I've been one of your hosts, Bob Mackey. You can find me on Twitter as Bob Servo, and my other podcast is Retronauts. It's a classic gaming podcast about old video games. Find that wherever you find podcasts or go to patreon.com slash retronauts. Sign up there for two full-length bonus episodes every month. Henry, how about you? Get all your news on Henry Gilbert if you follow on Twitter at H-E-N-E-R-E-Y-G. H-E-N-E-R-E-Y-G keeps you up to date in my world. And you can also follow on Twitter at at talk simpsons pod at talk simpsons pod that's the official twitter account of this podcast and all the related podcasts as well you will stay up to date when new episodes go live when there's information on the patreon when we're doing a poll any stuff that's going on in our lives for the talking simpsons podcast follow at talk simpsons pod to keep up with it thanks so much for joining us folks we'll see you next time for season 12's trilogy of error and we'll see you then Next time we see it, we'll do something more fun. Oh! What could be more fun than today's trip to the liquor store? Thanks for the beef jerky. Say goodbye to Grandpa, everyone. Bye. Good. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. You've got questions? O'Reilly Auto Parts has answers. Need a pro you can trust? We've got that, too. No matter what you need, our professional parts people have the training and expertise to help you do things right. Deep automotive knowledge. Just one part that makes O'Reilly stand apart. The professional parts people. Oh, oh.